Good morning, it's seven o'clock and you are watching your RTS News Channel of the Year. Doing very well, aren't we? Yes, we are. For the Absolute seventh year running. <laughs> Just saying. I know I can't leave it there all day, but I'm, we thought we'd open the show with it, didn't we? Totally, totally. It's been freshly polished. It's, it's pride of place. Yes, indeed. Um, a very good morning to you, wherever you're watching us around the world this morning. On today's programme, Esther Ramson makes a new call for MPs to vote on assisted dying. We'll speak to the government in just a moment on education. And we'll ask about plans to find parents in England £80 if their children miss school. It's Thursday, the 29th of February. We report from the Isle of Man, which looks set to become the first part of the British Isles to legalise assisted dying. But at the point where he got that bad, it was too late to starve himself Do to death. Do you want to see a change in the law? Desperately. I don't want to see anybody suffer like Simon did. The US Supreme Court says it will rule on whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution over the 6th of January Capitol riots. Doctors warn children are suffering needlessly with dangerous diseases like measles because parents aren't getting them vaccinated. I'm going to need a little privacy so you guys can blow. Not blow. Blow! One of America's best-loved comedians, Richard Lewis, dies at the age of 76. like to have a birthday in a leap year we'll tell you who's celebrating Chocolate cake, first thing, what's not to like? A very good morning to you, our top story for you this morning. Dame Esther Ranson has made a renewed call for MPs to debate the law on assisted dying. The 83-year-old star who has stage four cancer says the current law is a mess and families like hers desperately need change. Her intervention comes as MPs warn that the law in different parts of the UK is likely to diverge, with the Isle of Man set to become the first part of the British Isles to legalise assisted dying. Let's get more with Ashish Joshi. What can you do? Can you miss it? Oh. Sue's dogs are her distraction. A distraction from the pain and the loss. After months of sitting at her dying husband's bedside. In July 2021, Simon was diagnosed with the most aggressive form of motor neurone disease. He developed serious stomach complications and a chronic bed sore. I eventually said to the nurse, you know, why is this so bad? Why can't you get rid of it? And she said, I'm sad to say that Simon is decomposing while he's still alive. As Simon grew weaker, he took what little action he could to speed up the inevitable. He stopped eating. He'd chosen to starve himself to death if it carried on any longer. But at the point where he got that bad, it was too late to starve himself Do to death. Do you want to see a change in the law? Desperately. I don't want to see anybody suffer like Simon did. So this is the House of Keys, our, our Parliament on the Isle of Man. In parliaments across the British Isles, formal and informal talks are taking place to see if and how assisted dying can be legalised. Nowhere is closer to making it a reality than here on the Isle of Man. As people become more um, au fait with how assisted dying works, as they actually see it in practice and get the right training and support, more and more people see the benefits of it. The proposed bill would make assisted dying available to patients who meet a strict criteria. They must be adults who have the capacity to make decisions for themselves. Residents must have spent more than a year living on the Isle of Man. They must be suffering from a terminal illness where there is no likelihood of improvement and expected to die within six months. The proposals would see assisted dying provided through the island's health system, with doctors potentially offered an opt-in clause. It's the people with vulnerability that I'm most concerned about that may be coerced, um, maybe feel a perception of being worthless and not want to be here, maybe feel that not being a burden to their family is the right answer. And it's these vulnerable people in society that I feel may be sucked into assisted dying. 
Whatever happens here on the Isle of Man has no direct bearing on the rest of the British Isles. But it does show that some very difficult conversations are taking place. And if the assisted dying law is passed here, well, that could propel change elsewhere. All sides accept that this difficult debate must happen. It's about who has control over your life and death. Sit. Ashish Joshi, Sky News on the Isle of Man. And Esther Anson's daughter, will be, Rebecca, will be with us on the programme at half past nine this morning. Uh, rest of the news? The rest of the news. Let's start with that perennial topic, shall we? Donald Trump? Donald Trump, because the US Supreme Court said it will rule on whether he is immune from prosecution over the Capitol riots in January 2021. <laughs> Meanwhile, the former president has also been removed from the ballot in a third US state. Mark Stone has more from Washington on that Illinois judge's decision. Uh, the judge has decided to remove him because uh, the, the judge believes he is an insurrectionist. It follows a very similar decision made in Colorado late last year uh, and in the state of Maine. And uh, now that decision is stayed, as it's known, it is paused uh, until a, a bigger decision can be made by the Supreme Court here in Washington, D.C., over whether or not states have the right to remove candidates from the ballot. That's that. The other potentially much more significant development is, it, is a, an announcement by the Supreme Court uh, last night that they will hear the, the case uh, of whether or not Donald Trump is immune from prosecution. Now, this relates to the most serious of all the cases against Donald Trump. That is the federal case here in Washington related to his involvement in the January the 6th protests, riots, insurrection, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the decision uh, by the Supreme Court that they will make a judgment over whether or not Donald Trump uh, is immune from prosecution delays the case. It delays the federal case, a case that was due to start any time now, will now be delayed uh, until the summer at the very earliest. Now, what that means uh, is that potentially, if it's happening in the summer, it's so close to the election itself that it will be delayed until after the election. That will mean that the American people do not get to hear a case against a former president accused of the most serious of crimes, insurrection, until after the point at which they potentially choose him to be their next president. Parents in England who take their children out of school without permission are going to face higher fines. Penalties for unplanned absences are going up from 60 to 80 pounds in a drive to push up school attendance. We'll be hearing from the Education Minister in a few minutes' time. A new study has linked ultra-processed foods to poor mental health. Products such as sugary breakfast cereals, ready meals and fizzy drinks are associated with a 48 to 53 per cent greater risk of developing anxiety. Researchers are calling for policies which encourage people to eat healthier foods. Actor and comedian and star of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Richard Lewis, has died at the age of 76. Lewis was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease back in 2023. His co-star, Larry David, paid tribute to him as the rare combination of funny and sweet. He's also known for his role as Prince John in the classic Robin Hood Men in Tights. What? Loxley has struck again. <clears throat> I'm going to need a little privacy so you guys can blow. Not blow. Blow! So depressed. And now for some news about us here at Sky News. For the seventh consecutive year, we've won the News Channel of the Year at the Royal Television Society Awards. The jury said that Sky was given the award for the comprehensive way it covered the main news stories of the year, both in the UK and around the world. Meanwhile, political editor Beth Rigby was also awarded Political Journalist of the Year, being described as the standout winner. Sky News also took home the Innovation Award for its joint data project with Tortoise Media, Westminster Accounts. So, very shy. Yeah, can I? Can I? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Momentarily. Take your hands off it. Yeah, I've just dust, I've just polished it spesh. It looks seventh fantastic. year in a row. Seventh year in a row. Look is at remarkable. that, eh? Absolutely remarkable. Mm. News Channel of the Year, stiff competition this year as well. Actually, we were not sure at all that we would win it uh, until they said our names. 
What was that moment like last night? Oh, it was great. Mm. It was great. And lots of uh, our colleagues were there. And, uh, yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. Made a little speech and all that. And, uh, yeah, we were absolutely thrilled. Thrilled also for Beth and... Um, Hugely so. Yeah, and for Sam. That's enough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay where I am. OK. Now, the NHS has launched a new campaign to encourage parents to vaccinate their children after a spike in measles cases. Let's get more, should we? Amelia is standing by for us. Good morning. Good morning. To you. Congratulations to all of us, first of all. I think you missed a bit, though. I think you need to polish it a bit. I know. I've got a cloth here special. <laughs> um, tell me. So um, this is an NHS campaign launched to try to reverse uh, the decline in the uptake of vaccines for children. And it's uh, particularly targeting uh, inner city areas where this is a particular problem. Um, and actually, the, the voices in this campaign are children uh, that's supposed to resonate more with parents. Children are asking parents, uh, have we got our Not vaccinations sure. and are they up to date? So in terms of routine vaccinations, uh, children are protected against 13 diseases, some of which can have really severe uh, consequences if infected uh, with those diseases. But why is uptake so low? Well, the World Health Organization says that uh, uptake has been declining over the last uh, decade and it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. And they set target levels of uptake of 95% to try to uh, maintain uh, adequate health protection. But in the UK, nowhere, no vaccinations have hit uh, that target for 2022-23. And in the UK, that's being put down down to uh, parental complacency partly and also just hesitancy as well. And this, of course, comes off the back of an outbreak of measles cases. So the UK Health Security Agency, this is the, the body that deals with public health protection, has seen 650 cases since October, the majority in Birmingham uh, and the West Midlands, but now we're starting to see cases uh, in other places. So this is really a campaign uh, with the children's voices at the forefront, urging parents to get them vaccinated. Yeah. I thought we'd eradicated measles. It's something that health, uh, health officials are really worried about because we are seeing more and more cases, mm -hmm. but they are saying to parents, look, this is something that can be easily prevented with some, uh, some routine jabs. OK, for now, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Sky News has joined Ecuador's Navy patrols who are cracking down on cartels, shipping millions of dollars of drugs into North America. One recent bus saw one and a half tonnes of cocaine seized from a speedboat with a street value of $200 million. In the third of his special reports, our chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey joined the military on patrol off the coast of Esmeraldas. Armed Marines board fishing boats off Esmeraldas on Ecuador's Pacific coast. These intercepts are constant and part of the country's crackdown on cartel and gang activity. They're looking for drugs being smuggled to North America and abnormally large quantities of fuel the smugglers need for the journey north or signs of piracy. What they're looking for is not just necessarily drugs, oh, no, no, no. but it can actually be fuel as well. So some of the small fishing vessels can have um, fuel which will then be given to the fast boats that the drug users or the drug smugglers use. These are fairly random checks to see if the paperwork's correct or not. An interceptor speedboat is launched on the move from a Coast Guard cutter as more Marines begin another Pacific Ocean patrol. This crew is looking for bigger and faster drug smuggling vessels that use these waters. We're sailing off the Galapagos Islands. It sees rich with marine life. But the drug dealers aren't interested in this place. They don't even come ashore. Rather, they seek the quieter waters to the south of the Galapagos with less maritime traffic. We join Commander Xavier Rubio's team on one of their regular patrols on the cutter Isla Isabella. His crew recently captured a smuggler boat with one and a half tons of cocaine on board with a street value of $200 million in Europe. Air Force surveillance cameras show the interceptor boat closing in on the smugglers. They manoeuvre into the target vessel's wake at high speed. They're using the waves as cover. The smugglers at this point don't know they're there. Then they're spotted and the smugglers attempt to accelerate away. But the Coast Guard anticipate the move and overtake them and cut across its bow. 
the Marines board the vessel, arrest the crew and uncover their illegal cargo. A lot of people have discussed and I've, I've been reading about recently is that people who are using cocaine in, in North America or using cocaine in Europe and using cocaine in the UK, which is one of the big users, have no idea that it comes from somewhere and where it comes from there are gangs, there's poverty, there's murder, there's death. People don't think about the consequences. I don't know if people think about that, but we know that is one of the biggest business in the world and where the money is involved, bad people is involved. South American governments like Ecuador see taking the fight to the cartels and the gangs as their own war on terror. It will cost a fortune. This country sees this war as an actual fight for its survival. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Ecuador. Minister coming up in just a second after the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Next few days will bring further rain and it's going to turn colder with hill snow. Likely the southeastern quarter of England looks mild but wet through the rush hour. Elsewhere it's going to be quite chilly with blustery showers running into western coasts. The southeast of England will see further patchy rain this morning while most other parts will have sunny spells and showers. They'll be concentrated in the west, turning wintry in the north and also over the hills. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Education Minister is with us this morning. Damien Hines, good to see you. Thanks for taking morning, the time Jeff. to join us. Talk to me what you're planning to do um, about, um, I suppose, penalising parents if kids don't go to school. Well, look, this morning we're talking about school attendance. I will come on to penalty notice in a moment, but that's actually a relatively small part of what we are... Not if what you we, have to pay What it. we're talking about. Hang on. Just bear, bear with me a sec. So, we, look, since COVID... You're quite feisty this since, morning. <laughs> <laughs> since, uh, since COVID... <laughs> Since COVID, there has been an impact on school attendance overall, not directly because of children having COVID, but just changes in sort of thresholds, perhaps, that children will stay at home uh, with a relatively mild illness. And we've been trying to stress to people that, you know, the NHS guidance is you've got a mild cold. Actually, it is usually OK to be in school. Mild anxiety, actually, quite often it helps to be in school. And there's, there's very good NHS guidance around that. There's also so-called unauthorised absence which includes term time holidays. And there has to be a, a deterrent for, uh, for, for taking children out of school unnecessarily during, uh, during term time, because every day at school really, really matters. And that's where fixed penalty notices come in. The, the, the amount of the fixed penalty notice hasn't changed since 2012. It's been at 60 pounds for all that time. We are gonna change it to uh, 80 pounds if you pay within 21 days, but also make it consistent. Uh, across the country. Right now, in some parts of the country, uh, those, uh, those fines are used significantly and others really not much at all. So we're going to make sure that is a consistent approach across the country. But I stress it's only for unauthorised absence. What happens if parents don't pay? Well, as with fines in general, as, as you know, there is a system that you, uh, th th that you go through. Um, if you don't pay uh, within the 21 days, the, the amount goes up. Ultimately, of course, non-payment of fines Result, can, can result in, in proceedings as it can for other fines. But that's not where we want to be. I mean, we don't want people paying these fines at all. We want, we want the children well, to be well, Let me just check what you're saying. Are you saying that if the parents don't pay, eventually they could face prosecution? So, it, it, look, it's a legal requirement to have that's a suitable, a yes, to have though, a suitable education for your child. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, not, that's not a new announcement we're making no, today, Kay. That's, that has long been, that's long been the case. What the penalties will be. We have, look... The other thing to say is we have what we call a support first approach. So you're talking about uh, fixed penalty notices for unauthorised absence. That's far down the line. We want to be working with, with families and schools do an amazing job uh, having sensitive conversations, encouraging conversations with parents and with pupils themselves about getting kids back into school and back into a, a regular a timetable. And all of that is, is very, very good work and has produced results already, you know, last term, Attendance at school was materially better than, than the equivalent term the year before. But we're still not quite back at the place we were before COVID. And that's where we need to be, because every day in school really matters. Even missing school for relatively small amounts of time has a discernible 
impact on how children do at school, as well as, by the way, being with friends and all the other things, the other great things about being in school. So, obviously, every child at some point is going to need to be off school sick. Uh, that's always been true. But where there is avoidable absence, that's what we really, really want to bring OK, down. but just to clarify, Minister, if it is unauthorised access for whatever reason, you've taken them on a skiing holiday or you need them at home and you've not told the school that they're going to be off, ultimately, if you don't pay that penalty, then you will be prosecuted. So, look, there is, there is always discretion in the system. So, first of all, we've got a threshold for when a fixed penalty notice would be issued, but it's only that it would be considered to be issued. That's, what, ten, ten sessions of unauthorised absence in a ten-week period, so effectively one week in, in ten. Uh, then you'd be considered for this. Then, of course, uh, you would be... If you are issued the fine, then, yes, you, you do have to pay it, and that is... That's, that's a feature throughout our, throughout our system that when fines are issued, there is a requirement to do so and there is a, there is a penalty for not, paying, for not paying the penalty. But we don't, want, we don't want parents to be there. That's not the point of this. This is meant to be there as a, as a deterrent because it is incredibly important okay. for children to be uh, in school. We have some guests on the programme later on in, uh, who are calling for action after a report found 20,000 autistic students have missed out on 10% or more of their education. Thoughts on that? Yes, so children with special educational needs, children with what are called EHCPs, education, health and care plans, do have higher levels of absence than, uh, th than other children and quite often require extra support. Our guidance, which today becomes... We are making statutory, uh, is, is very keen to stress, of course, and schools do this, uh, that there is extra extra support required for uh, children, some often children with special educational needs, sensitive conversations with parents and supporting them through their uh, through 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 those uh, through those points to, to try and make sure that they can benefit as much as possible from as many days as possible being in school. How concerned are you? Uh, that um, ITV has decided to make a drama series like they did about the post office on the compensation for infective blood inquiry? Well, look, the, I mean, we talk about the post office scandal and the terrible injustice that has been and the proportions of it uh, compared to other things we've known. I mean, the infected blood scandal is, is like that, but over a much... Uh, over a longer period. Uh, I've met some of the people who've been who've been affected, who've been who've been victims. It is the most awful uh, scandal uh, that that we have had in in our country. I don't know what's going to be in the in the ITV drama. I think, by the way, what they did with the uh, with the post office and Mr Bates, I mean, actually, was quite an extraordinary. It was, was really it was really quite quite an extraordinary quite an extraordinary thing. Okay, um, we heard the Prime Minister yesterday talk about. Um growing consensus that mob rule is replacing democratic rule, is referring particularly to what's happening with marches and also demonstrations outside um, MPs' homes. Do you think mob rule is an appropriate use of language? I don't think mob rule is an appropriate thing that we should ever con consider to be acceptable in our is country. Is that what it is, though? We've got a, a representative liberal democracy, which you and I are very proud of and, and, and defend. There are some people who would seek to overcome that representative liberal democracy by bringing intimidatory tactics into the, uh, into the mix and uh, be, being outside people's homes. We've talked about MPs. It doesn't necessarily just have to be MPs, by the way. Uh, journalism is another very sensitive area of our, of, of, of our system. Bringing those tactics to bear is not... Uh, is not is far far from appropriate in a in a representative uh, system like ours. But is de defining those group of people as a mob um, incendiary? I, I think well, pe people can make their own judgments, can't they? From watching What's the judgment? from watching the television. Well, you have many you have many viewers, and they will all make their own judgments. I, I I I think uh, appearing outside somebody's home, whether that's an elected representative or somebody else in a, in a public uh, position, I think, I think that absolutely crosses the line. And I think people need to remember that it's not, only about, it's not only about us, it's not only about the individual. We have teams who you know, work with us in our place of work and we have, you know, people have families. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing for everyone to remember. You'd be very pleased to know, I'm not going to ask you about Lee Anderson because I know exactly what you're going to say. You're going to say his words were wrong but not racist, weren't you? 
Well, having just said you weren't going to ask me, I mean, yes, I do think what he said was wrong. I mean, I think it was deeply, it was deeply personal, uh, and he shouldn't have and shouldn't have said it. Mm. And a final thought about uh, Dame Esther Ransom. We've got her daughter on the programme yes. a little bit later on. Um, she thinks uh, the, the laws in this country are a mess. Uh, and, as you know, she feels that she needs to go when the time comes to um, end her life at Dignitas. What are we going to do to try and sort this out? The, the, these, are, these are the most sensitive matters, of course. And you're talking about people, uh, individuals and their families and loved ones in you the, in, in the most... You? In the most uh, well, I'm very happy to talk about what, what, what I've done. But, look, I'm, I think I'm, I'm here on your programme as a, as a government minister and I wouldn't want to... See, I wouldn't want to give any uh, indication of something as was representing a government view. Th these are not matters that are opined on by the government. These are parliamentary decisions that what's called conscience uh, issues uh, and are not uh, are not whipped. And I think that's the right way. That's the right way to do it. By the way, it's another great strength of our representative liberal democracy. That not all representative liberal democracies have. They are very sensitive. There will be a respectful. An important debate as and when any of these, quest these questions that. come I, to the I floor of the House of Commons. But... Absolutely, but but my question is, well, you, why I mean, have you reached your view? Well, look, you you can see my as a, you know you, you can see my voting record, and, yeah. and I I've decided that although in the, in, in the past when these votes have come, I've decided that although uh, uh, as I say these are almost unimaginable decisions to be in, and, and you must have absolute respect for. The decisions that people make. Uh, I decided at that, at that time that I did not think it was right uh, at that time for a change in the law. But that is not that is not me representing a government position. No, you've asked me that directly. I'm your you've fear. asked me directly about why I voted in the way I did. Yes, I did, and I also wondered what you would say to um, Dame Esther, given that she feels that it's a mess and it needs to be sorted out. Well, I have entire respect for Dame Esther and her and her. And her entire family. I mean, in her obviously extremely, extremely difficult situation, and by extension, their extremely difficult situation, and being able to talk about some of these uh, some of these issues uh, publicly, I think, does a great service to, uh, to, to to public debate. But there will still be a, a, a you know, as and when any such votes uh, comes to the comes to the House of Commons, there'll be a respectful. A respectful discussion and consideration of the issues mm. on, you won't on, change on your mind, from, from all perspectives. You won't change your view, though. Well, I can never say. I can never say for, for sure because that's the way that that's the way that we have democratic decision making in this country. I've told you what what my um, I've told you what my thought process has been in the past. These are not government decisions. They are for individual members of parliament to come to a come to a decision of, of conscience. OK, it's good to see you, Minister. Thanks for Thank taking you. the time. Very much appreciated. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about that um, in more detail when um, Dame Esther's daughter will be joining us here on the programme from at 9.30 today. Still to come on The Breakfast Show. Going to be hearing from one of the last survivors of the infected blood scandals who's furious that they are still waiting for compensation. So there's going to be more on that as well. So do stay tuned for more on that. Meantime, um, Murray, um, thoughts on fining parents whose kids don't or miss school for whatever reason and he said they would be prosecuted yeah i thought that was really interesting can you imagine going from uh, an 80 pound fine to being prosecuted if you don't pay it i mean it's difficult isn't it because and, and you were right to say it's not just a COVID problem because the government have been trying to say this is kind of because of COVID and actually this was happening before COVID. And I think it's a difficult one because in some, so many ways, something does need to be done to make sure that children are being monitored, looked after and are not just falling through the cracks. And you can understand why the government wants to do something about that. But nonetheless, a lot of critics would say that this is not the answer. So, for instance, we've heard from the General Secretary of the National Education Union and they said, finding parents in a cost of living crisis is just going to drive them into debt uh, potentially people who are trying to uh, make ends meet just about as it is this could push them over the edge uh, they said there's no evidence that finding parents actually improves 
attendance. There is no data to support that. Uh, and also, they say the priority should be more funding and more access to mental health support for children so that they feel uh, able to attend and comfortable in expressing what their difficulties, their problems are, and therefore then we can try and address them and fix them, and that might improve attendance. So there's a debate around whether this is really the way to do it. And a lot of people would obviously be very concerned about the possibility of not just fines and then increasing fines, but also prosecution for something that could go from something potentially quite small to something really quite life-changing. OK. Um, for now, thanks very much indeed. With us throughout the show, of course. Thank you. Still to come on The Breakfast programme for you. Lighting up the deep blue sea, scientists solve the mystery behind why these fish change colour. What are they? Oh, it says on the screen. There they are. <laughs> and fed up of traffic jams? Soon you'll be able to fly over them if you've got a fat wallet. and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? You I am angry. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Mum, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to get in, you just don't cross her. You're so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Again, everybody, you're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News, talking about assisted dying today. Esther Ranson's daughter will be on the programme later on. You've got the latest on that for us this year. Yes, I spent a few days on the Isle of Man, which looks like it might, with Jersey, become the first part of the, the, the British Isles, which is seriously considering implementing legislation to allow it to happen. Assisted dying, uh, strict criteria around it, but the debate is still ongoing on the Isle of Man, but what it's done is it's prompted a wider debate across the British Isles and the United Kingdom because there has been a select committee report which has been published today, which is unusual because it's been gathering evidence over many, many months, listening to testimony from a lot of people and has stopped short of urging the government. Most of these inquiries present a report which urges governments to actually take action, but it hasn't. It said 
This is up to Parliament, but we want to open up the debate. And Esther Ranson coming out today again, saying that the law in this country is a mess and she wants to, to, for it to go much further. She wants it to be introduced as legislation. Hugely emotive, hugely divisive issue. But I think I sense from speaking to people after this report too, that people are more prepared to have this conversation than there have been in the past. You have to live there for a year, I think, on the Isle of Man before you can be considered. I was speaking to a guest at six whose wife went to Dignitas in Switzerland and he read part of the letter that they circulated to her friends and family after he'd returned from Switzerland. What was striking was they told barely anybody what they were doing because of the fear with regards to the legislation, the legality of even travelling to Switzerland. You can be arrested. Okay. You can be arrested. He was interviewed by officers. He went and, and told officers after they came back what had happened and was interviewed as a result. But they, they had to keep that situation yeah. secret from those closest to them. Mm. And this situation in the Isle of Man, you know, maybe people will be able to go and move there for a year if they are so inclined. That is one of the concerns that was expressed, that, that it becomes a, a, a death travel tourism uh, destination. And that's a real concern. And also the impact it might have on existing palliative end-of-life care on the island. Where does the money go? Where, where do the funds go? Does, you know, does the health service there then start thinking about end-of-life services or is it more geared towards people um, having assisted dying? Yeah. But you speak to people who have witnessed their loved ones die the most excruciating way and you have nothing but sympathy for those of people. Of course. And I think I'm right in saying it was Keir Starmer who, when he was DPP, Director of Public Prosecutions, um, said, although potentially you could serve 14 years in prison, he's going to be much more lenient than that. Yeah, I think that the idea of putting someone in prison for something like that for a long period of time would come across as really quite heartless in mm. so many ways. I mean, it's a really, really difficult, emotionally charged topic. Talk to any MP or even a peer in the House of Lords and they are all very divided on it and also very, very, very passionate about their side of the argument. And I remember doing... I wrote a piece about this a couple of years ago uh, and I remember talking to, for instance, Danny Kruger, who's a big yes. campaigner on not allowing assisted dying and a lot of people are very concerned about disabled people and the elderly who might be considered a burden or being worried about feeling like a burden yeah, and therefore the, the point, pressure yeah. of that yeah. and how do you protect those people and ensure that they are 100% making a decision for themselves without any other kind of string factors pulling them. More online with your piece? Yes, lots more. There's a long read online, more interviews with um, uh, women who have seen their loved ones um, go through horrible deaths and strong arguments from the m medical side about exactly what Mari was talking about. Coercion, the slippery slope, the safeguards needed to make sure that, um, you know, if you introduce legislation like this, vulnerable people are protected. OK. Quick look at the top stories. The top stories this morning, yes. Let's, as we've just been saying, Dame Esther Ranson has been talking about the situation with regards to assisted dying. She's called on MPs to debate that law. Her intervention comes as MPs warn that the law in different parts of the UK is likely to diverge, with the Isle of Man set to become the first part of the UK if the, to legalise assisted dying. Parents in England who take their children out of school without permission are going to face higher fines of £80. The Education Minister, Damien Hines, told this show just a few minutes ago that parents who don't pay could eventually face prosecution. He hoped the measure would improve attendance. The US Supreme Court says it will rule on whether Donald Trump's immune from prosecution over the January 6th Capitol riots. Meanwhile, the former president's campaign team has said he will appeal a court ruling in Illinois which will remove him from the state's primary ballot next month. Health experts say children are suffering needlessly because fewer parents are opting to get them vaccinated. The UK Health Security Agency is launching a new campaign to try and boost uptake. Let's talk in more detail about victims of the infected blood scandal calling on the Chancellor to set out a compensation plan in next week's budget. Uh, joining us is Richard Warwick, who was infected with HIV and hepatitis C as a child. Hi, Richard. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Um, how did you find out that you were infected? Well, I was uh, tested for HIV um, in 1984, but I wasn't actually told for three years later uh, in 1988. As uh, hepatitis C, um, I was again tested in 1990, uh, 1993 
and uh, I came back positive for that and Hep B going back as far as 1987, so it's 19, 1978, uh, I contracted that then and this was all given to me through contaminated blood products to, to treat my haemophilia. How do, how do you feel about the way the government's been handling this? Honestly, I think it's cruel and I'd even go as far to say as inhumane. Um, we've now lost 680 people um, since the start of the inquiry in 2018. And to put that into some sort of perspective, that's if you compare it to the MPs, we've got um, so 650 in the House of Commons and 30 in the Lords. So we've lost 680 people. Um, so that's you know one for every member of Parliament and 30 Lords. So it's a huge number of people that have died. Um, and since the compensation report came out and was delivered to government in April of last year, uh, another 82 have died. So it, it sort of puts it into perspective of just how urgent it is that the government pulls their finger out and addresses this issue. Uh, they have all the information they need. They have all the people in the books, specifically those that were directly infected. So there should be no problem paying those. There aren't going to be any further recommendations made by the inquiry. Sir Brian Langstaff made this very clear that there was nothing else to see. There won't be anything else published in the final report. So the guidelines for compensation have been in the government's hand for, hands for 10 months now. There won't be any further advice. So I just don't know what they're doing. As far as delays, um, they're obviously playing for time. Now, we've seen over previous uh, administrations that, that one government tends to pass this issue kick it down the road, if you like, to the next administration and let them deal with it. Um, but a lot of us in the infected blood community, ones that are, are suffering, particularly parents that have lost children and siblings that have lost their parents, is they, there's this consensus that they're, as hard as it is to believe, there's a consensus that they're waiting for us to die because every person that dies every four days, that's another person that, that falls by the wayside, is one less person that they will have to fork out money for, unfortunately. Oh, what a thought, what a thought. ITV um, due to make a series about the um, treatment disaster. We saw what happened as a result of um, Mr Bates versus the post office. Do you think this will finally shine a light into those dark corners that haven't been exposed sufficiently up to now? Hmm. Good question. Well, how long is a drama going to take to produce? A um, year, two years? That'll be a heck of a lot more people that will have died by the time the drama comes out. Um, that will obviously enrage the public when it does come out, if it's, if it's told faithfully and the, the, the facts are are laid down and, and people's lives are portrayed in the in the manner in which we've been suffering. Uh, it shouldn't need a drama to address this issue. Um, it's it's plain and it's plain and simple. The, the report, when it comes out in May next year, will be damning. Um, I can't overestimate, under, sorry, overstate just how how damning it will be to, to government ministers, to the health service, um, the advisors, the physicians. It really will be damning. So um, I, I, I really don't know what, el what else to, to think. Uh, there, there's no reason for them to, to drag this out any longer. Um, yeah. Look after yourself, it, Richard. Um, thank, yeah, thanks for I'll taking try. the time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yes. Take, thanks. take care. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about Vladimir Putin. He's going to deliver his annual address to Russia's Federal Assembly this morning. Diana is in Moscow for us. Hi, Diana. Will it be one of those speeches that lasts days? <laughs> well, uh, the average apparently is one hour, ten minutes, so it won't be exceptionally long. 2018, when he announced this whole raft of new nuclear weapons, 
it was uh, nearly two hours. Um, but yes, it's basically the equivalent of the State of the Nation address in America, and it will lay out his program for the next year and the next six years, even though um, supposedly there's an election coming up in two and a half weeks. But we all know that this is not a country where there is a democracy, um, and we all know exactly who will be president once this election is over. And Alexei Navalny's funeral was meant to be held um, today, or the family were hoping that it would be approved to be held today. But uh, seemingly, the Kremlin did not want that to detract from Vladimir Putin's speech. Um, so the funeral will be held tomorrow in a suburb of uh, Moscow, where Alexei Navalny grew up. Um, we don't know how that will pan out, whether there will be detentions, as we have seen um, with people laying flowers to pay their respects to Navalny. Um, so it will be a dramatic day. But I think what the Kremlin um, is aware of is the message from Yulia Navalnaya when she basically questioned Vladimir Putin's orthodox faith for not giving the body back to the family. Um, now there will be a funeral. It doesn't look good if there are lots of detentions at a moment of remembrance like that. We shall have to see what tomorrow brings. But today, yes, today will be bombast, uh, splendor, all of his plans for the future. Last year, he said that Russia is, um, it, it is impossible to uh, defeat Russia on the battlefield. I think the fact that, even the fact that he's invited us this year, which has not happened for a long time, is a sign of his renewed confidence, recognizing that there is a consternation in the West about how Ukraine uh, and the fight there is going, about whether weapons will be uh, brought into the fight, about whether Congress will allow that uh, aid package through. Um, and I think after the success for Russia at Avdivka, Putin is feeling pretty confident. Okay, for now, thank you, Diana. Still to come on The Breakfast Show on the Royal Television Society News Channel of the Year, seven years on the bounce. Why do marlins change colour during hunting? We'll speak to the scientist who solved the mystery. Plus... Very special birthday for some today. We'll tell you who's celebrating their birthday on this leap year. So it's a comedy improvisation show, so we ask the audience for suggestions and then we make stuff up based on what they say. So they're a part of the show. <laughs> I do that us. for a living. Yes. <laughs> so do we. So do we. <laughs> you do sometimes, I mean, there is sometimes we play a game where we ask people to write down lines of dialogue and because it's sort of anonymous, sometimes people write down things and you think, no, that's yeah. not, that's not going to be funny. You know. Filthy, filthy thing. Or if there's a very bad... Tragic story in the news. You know that's not something that you're going to get any laughs from, or, or you would want to. Um, but it, but but also as well, when you ask people to shout out suggestions, they also they sometimes shout out things like you say, "Could I have a place of work?" And I'll say, "Abattoir." And you go, well, that's yeah. oh, that's not going <laughs> to. Yeah. You know, there's not going to be much fun in that. That's part of what I think entertainment can be. It's an escape from the real world for a while. A kind of a, a kind of sort of relaxation away from it, a kind of sort of refresher so that you're not always constantly thinking about what's in the news, because let's face it, the news by its very nature is, is usually pretty, pretty grim. You constantly feel slightly nervous or excited. It depends how you view it. I think it's exciting mm -hmm. um, and it slips into nerves if you haven't done a show for a while mm -hmm. or if there's somebody in that you particularly want to impress. But mostly it's just exciting. It's a, a good adrenaline ride. The first time when I started doing improvised comedy back in the 80s, I did quite a bit of work with Mike Myers, who went to, you know, people we know from Austin Powers and Wayne's World. And he was so fluent at what he did that I remember just looking at him thinking, I can see you doing it, but it still seems impossible. But of course, after a few months of practice and experience, you, you start to not be as good as him, but you start to be as fluent. The great thing about sort of the improvised comedy thing is like you have a comic idea and you do it and you find out straight away in comedy, you find out straight away whether it's funny or not because the audience tells you by laughing. Um, you can have a comedy idea, write it down on a piece of paper, hand it to somebody, a, a TV organisation, not hear anything for about a year and it comes back with not funny stamped on it, you know. <laughs> Whereas with this, you can immediately get that, that rapport and, yeah. and, and that instant reaction. At the Comedy Store in London. OK. Yes. How long for? Well, we start on Wednesday, March the 6th and then we keep going. 
saying it's a residency. Yeah, improv. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're there every Wednesday at Former some point. And Suki Webster's improv show. Yeah. That's what it's called. At some point we'll take a break, mm. but for now we're there every Wednesday at the Comedy Store. Now they're one of the fastest fish in the sea and they also light up. I am, of course, talking about marlins, obviously, <laughs> whose flashing fins have long left scientists perplexed. But in what you could say was a light bulb moment, a team from Germany finally solved the mystery. Among them was uh, Alicia Burns, a researcher at Humboldt University, who joins us now from Berlin. Hi, good to see you. Thank you. Tell us more about them. Good morning. Um, yeah, so this is a, it was a bit of a Goldilocks moment for us. So we've been studying the marlins for a number of years now, um, interested in how they hunt. So marlins are a really fascinating fish in that they're usually solitary, but every year off the coast of Mexico, they, they flock there towards the sardines and they basically hunt in packs in the same way that sort of lions or wolves do it. But the thing that's super interesting about marlins is they're usually by themselves. So there's no central coordination or alpha or anything like that. Um, so we've been interested in how they hunt and, and for a while we've been trying to work out how they coordinate those hunts. Um, and it wasn't until we sort of had this perfect Goldilocks conditions of these flat seas, no wind, that we really saw this brightening, lighting up um, as they go into attack. And what we think is happening is that they're actually either signalling to their mates um, to, to back off, because obviously they've got a big weapon on their face, they don't want to damage it. Um, but uh, also it could just be sort of their excitement to, that they're going into hunt. So it was a pretty exciting thing to see. So we've known that they've been able to light up for years. You know, ask any fisherman, they'll, they'll be able to tell you that pretty quickly. Um, but we always thought it was a bit of an excitement response, so almost like getting flushed or, or blushing in humans, um, getting excited and just getting brighter. But we, we think it's, it's pretty clear that it's, um, it's targeted towards actually hunting, which is pretty cool. What's it like to be in the water with them? A little bit scary, a bit intimidating. It's, I mean, it's as soon as you jump in, it's, it's amazing. They're everywhere. The, the scary part is that they come from sort of behind you at full speed um, with a big spear on their face. So you're always a little bit wary that they might miss um, and, and make a bit of a mistake. And there have been a lot of reports actually of, you know, turtles and sharks washing up with spears straight, straight through the middle. Even fishermen have had some stories. So it's a bit intimidating, but I mean, once you're in there, it's so fascinating to watch. It's like being in the middle of a Blue Planet episode. So it's pretty cool. What was the best place to see them, Alicia? So we film off Baja um, on the Pacific side of the Baja coast off Mexico. So, and that's a really perfect place for them. The, the seas are calm, it's beautiful and clear, um, and we get these huge aggregations of them. So that's really the perfect place to see. It's what's known as the, the sardine run of Mexico. So, um, and thankfully we haven't seen any sharks there. So it's a little bit um, safer, I guess, to jump in the water as opposed to some other places around the world. So it's, yeah, it's quite <laughs> nice over there. It's good to see you, Alicia. Thanks very much indeed for taking the time. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now, running late, stuck in traffic. The answer's on the way. If you've got a spare few thousand pounds, that's right, a real life flying car. The Aleph Aeronautics Model A is designed for the road, but it's also got propellers in the bonnet and the boot, which means in theory you can simply take off when the traffic gets just a bit too much. Production starts in 2025, but the cost? £235,000 to get one of your own. Also, do you need a pilot's licence? I wonder. Quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, next few days will bring further rain and it'll turn colder with hill snow likely. The southeastern quarter of England looks mild but wet.
through the rush hour elsewhere. It'll be quite chilly with blustery showers running into western coast. The southeast of England will see further patchy rain this morning, while most other parts will have sunny spells and showers. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Quick look at the front pages. Who was the Guardian? Was that was that, me. That was you. That was me, the Tell Guardian's me. front page this morning, talking about um, ultra-processed foods and the, the damaging effects they can have. Sure. And, and increasingly, I think we're understanding what food does and doesn't do to us. But I'm always shocked how this list gets longer and longer. Things like low-fat yoghurt, zero-fat yoghurt, for example, is considered an ultra-processed food. Things you think are healthy, like protein bars, an ultra-processed food. And it strikes me it comes back again to education in schools about what we do with regards to Absolutely. eating and feeding and cooking for ourselves. Absolutely. And uh, the times for me, uh, particularly when it comes to whose birthday it is today, because, of course, it's the 29th of February. Yeah. So, at Lucian Grange, my old mucker at the top there. Um, so, Lucian, I should say, because it's his birthday. Um, and there he is, uh, with his Hollywood star of fame. So, if it's if your birthday on the 29th of February, yeah. quite often on legal forms, mm -hmm. there isn't the 29th of February, so it's either the 28th of February or the 1st of March. Yeah. So, although he's 64 today, he is, in fact, 16. I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> I actually know someone who's born on the 29th of February and their husband was also born on the 28th. So they had to share their birthdays and then one every four, every four years, she got her own birthday. There you go. <laughs> and for you? And for me, well, it was very similar. It was the Daily Mail. So um, page three of the Daily Mail, there are quadruplets who were all born on the 29th of oh, February. Can you imagine the chances? Um, so they're turning three today instead of 12. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Gorgeous little stop. boys. I know you've got pictures of them when they were born when they were little and then them turning 12 slash 3 now yeah would you choose the 28th of february or the 1st of march 28th of february i, I think. think so i would choose the 1st of march because, of course you would because it feels like spring february's <gasps> winter march is spring yeah so i feel like okay i'm born in spring yeah. i'm a spring mm. baby yeah you know? there's only 76 days in february isn't there it certainly feels like that <laughs> <laughs> we're back in just a few moments to stay tuned
Hello, everybody. A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock, and you are watching your Royal Television Society News Channel of the Year. For the seventh time right. On the banks. Smashing it, Kay. Here we are, <laughs> aren't we? Good honours. Coming up on today's programme, Esther Ranson makes a new call for MPs to vote on assisted dying. Plus, the plans to increase fines for families whose children miss school. The Education Minister insists they're working with parents, but if you don't pay, you could be facing prosecution. And do you prefer to leave your partner behind as you jet off on holiday? We'll have more on the rise in solo travel. We will. It's Thursday, the 29th of February. A report from the Isle of Man, which looks set to become the first part of the British Isles to legalise assisted dying. But at the point where he got that bad, it was too late to starve himself. Do to you death. want to see a change in the law? Desperately. I don't want to see anybody suffer like Simon did. The US Supreme Court says it will rule on whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution over the 6th of January Capitol riots. Doctors warn children are suffering needlessly with dangerous diseases like measles because parents aren't getting them vaccinated. I'm going to need a little privacy so you guys can blow. Not blow. Blow! Best of comedian Richard Lewis dies. And what's it like to have a birthday in a leap year? We'll tell you who's celebrating. Let's talk about assisted dying as she is with us this morning. Isla Mann. Isle of Man is one of two jurisdictions which look likely to legalise some form of assisted dying. There's the Isle of Man, which the, the legislation is moving through its parliament right now, or possibly Jersey. This will have an impact on the rest of the British Isles, and there's been a select uh, committee report into assisted dying saying if the jurisdiction... Um, if, if it changes in other parts of the British Isles, then we've got to start really thinking about what we do here. And this morning, Esther Ransom has made a repeated call for MPs to introduce legislation in this country. She says the law is a mess. I've spent a few days on the Isle of Man talking to people on both sides of what is a hugely emotive and divisive issue. What can you do? Can you do me sis? Oh. Sue's dogs are her oh. distraction. A distraction from the pain oh. and the loss after months of sitting at her dying husband's bedside. In July 2021, Simon was diagnosed with the most aggressive form of motor neurone disease. He developed serious stomach complications and a chronic bed sore. I eventually said to the nurse, you know, why is this so bad? Why can't you get rid of it? And she said, I'm sad to say that Simon is decomposing while he's still alive. As Simon grew weaker, he took what little action he could to speed up the inevitable. He stopped eating. He'd chosen to starve himself to death if it carried on any longer. But at the point where he got that bad, it was too late to starve himself Do to death. Do you want to see a change in the law? Desperately. I don't want to see anybody suffer like Simon did. So this is the House of Keys, our, our Parliament on the Isle of Man. In parliaments across the British Isles, formal and informal talks are taking place to see if and how assisted dying can be legalised. Nowhere is closer to making it a reality than here on the Isle of Man. As people become more um, au fait with how assisted dying works, as they actually see it in practice and get the right training and support, more and more people see the benefits of it. The proposed bill would make assisted dying available to patients who meet a strict criteria. They must be adults who have the capacity to make decisions for themselves. Residents must have spent more than a year living on the Isle of Man. They must be suffering from a terminal illness where there is no likelihood of improvement and expected to die within six months. The proposals would see assisted dying provided through the island's health system, with doctors potentially offered 
an opt-in clause. It's the people with vulnerability that I'm most concerned about that may be coerced, um, maybe feel a perception of being worthless and not want to be here, maybe feel that not being a burden to their family is the right answer. And it's these vulnerable people in society that I feel may be sucked into assisted dying. Whatever happens here on the Isle of Man has no direct bearing on the rest of the British Isles. But it does show that some very difficult conversations are taking place. And if the assisted dying law is passed here, well, that could propel change elsewhere. All sides accept that this difficult debate must happen. It's about who has control over your life and death. Sit. Ashish Joshi, Sky News on the Isle of Man. Similar circumstances on Jersey? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're similar circumstances, but everyone's really concerned about the safeguards you, you put into place. That's where uh, the debate really widens, because you'll have people like Sue who have very compelling reasons for the introduction of assisted dying or assisted suicide. And then when you heard the doctor in that report there talking about the slippery slope, the coercion, and, and that's what it is. It's finding a balance that everyone is happy with, which, of course, they won't be. OK, for now, Ashish, thank you. Uh, rest of today's top stories? Yes, Donald Trump in court again. again. The US Supreme Court, though, ruling whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution over the Capitol riots in January 2021. Meanwhile, the former president has also been removed from the ballot in a third US state. Mark Stone has more from Washington on that Illinois judge's decision. Uh, the judge has decided to remove him because uh, the, the judge believes he is an insurrectionist. It follows a very similar decision made in Colorado late last year uh, and in the state of Maine. Uh, now, that decision is stayed, as it's known, it is paused uh, until a, a bigger decision can be made by the Supreme Court here in Washington, D.C., over whether or not states have the right to remove candidates from the ballot. That's that. The other potentially much more significant development is, it, is a, an announcement by the Supreme Court uh, last night that they will hear the, the case uh, of whether or not Donald Trump is immune from prosecution. Now, this relates to the most serious of all the cases against Donald Trump. That is the federal case here in Washington related to his involvement in the January the 6th protest, riots, insurrection, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the decision uh, by the Supreme Court that they will make a judgment over whether or not Donald Trump uh, is immune from prosecution delays the case. It delays the federal case, a case that was due to start any time now, will now be delayed uh, until the summer at the very earliest. Now, what that means uh, is that potentially, if it's happening in the summer, it's so close to the election itself that it will be delayed until after the election. That will mean that the American people do not get to hear a case against a former president accused of the most serious of crimes, insurrection, until after the point at which they potentially choose him to be their next president. A new study has linked ultra-processed foods to poor mental health. Products such as sugary breakfast cereals, ready meals and fizzy drinks were associated with a 48 to 53 per cent greater risk of developing anxiety. Researchers are calling for policies which encourage people to eat healthier foods. Actor and comedian and star of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Richard Lewis, has died at the age of 76. I'm going to need a little privacy so you guys can blow. Not blow. Blow! Lewis was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2023. His co-star, Larry David, paid tribute to him as the rare combination of funny and sweet. He's also known for his role as Prince John in the classic Robin Hood, Men in Tights. Stop me. And now for some news about us here at Sky News. For the seventh consecutive year, Sky News has won News Channel of the Year at the Royal Television Society Awards. The jury said that Sky was given the award for the comprehensive way it covered the main news stories of the year, both in the UK and around the world. Political editor Beth Rigby was also awarded Political Journalist of the Year, being described as the standout winner. Sky News also took home the Innovation Award for its joint data project with Tortoise Media, Westminster Accounts.
It's a little polish there, you know, <laughs> keep, it, keep it shiny. Exactly. Don't know why you've given it to me, then. <laughs> OK, give it back now, just so you could feel how heavy it was. Do you want to... No, OK. Uh, yeah, seven years on the bounce. How cool is that? Incredibly impressive. Testament yeah. to everybody that works on the channel. Yes, absolutely right. Put the cloth back down again. Carry on with the news. Government has announced plans for higher fines of £80 for parents in England who take their children out of school without permission. What happens if they don't pay? Well, if they don't pay, Kay, there's a possibility they could be prosecuted, which is seems like a massive escalation from uh, a small fine. But this is really the government's efforts to try and prove uh, that they are cracking down on absenteeism in schools and making sure that especially vulnerable children who are maybe falling through the cracks uh, are not essentially uh, disappearing off the system. So there's going to be this central register of attendance for schools, for children in schools. The difficulty is some people believe it's not really going to do its job. So, for instance, the General Secretary of the National Education Union has said that actually fining parents is not effective in improving attendance. They essentially say that, that there's no evidence to prove that really works. And they personally believe things like funding for mental health support and access to mental health support for children and students uh, is a better way of improving attendance instead. And then Damien Hines was on the programme speaking to you and explaining that, yes, Technically, there's a possibility people could be prosecuted. Oh, I was going to do that, but you did it. Here he is. What happens if parents don't pay? Well, as with fines in general, as as you know, there is a system that you uh, that, that you go through. Um, if you don't pay uh, within the 21 days, the the amount goes up. Ultimately, of course, non-payment of fines results can, can result in in proceedings as it can for other fines. But that's not where we want to be. I mean, we don't want people paying these fines at all. We want, we want the children well, to be in school. Let me just check what you're saying. Are you saying that if the parents don't pay, eventually they could face prosecution? So, it, it, look, it's a legal requirement to have that's a suitable, a yes, though, have a suitable education for your child. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, not, that's not a new announcement we're making no, today, Kay. That's, that has long been, that's long been the case. What the penalties will be. We have, look, the other thing to say is we have what we call a support first approach. So you're talking about uh, fixed penalty notices for unauthorised absence. That's far down the line. We want to be working with, with families and schools do an amazing job uh, having sensitive conversations, encouraging conversations with parents and with pupils themselves. Yeah, it's a yes, though, isn't it? It's a yes, Kay. I mean, he kept saying, oh, you know, that's far down the line. He didn't really want to talk about that. Let's talk about encouraging parents, trying to talk about, essentially, the positive ways you can get children to attend school. But nonetheless, uh, he couldn't say it wasn't true because it is true. It is a possibility, and I think that will obviously worry certain parents. Uh, and also, there's no new money for this initiative, so some schools may argue we're already under so much pressure, we already have so much to do, and now we have this extra thing on our hands in terms of... Uh, this new register. So I think the difficulty is some voices in the education community are always going to say we have too many things to do uh, and not enough time or resources. OK, for now, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, Sky News has joined Ecuador's Navy patrols who are cracking down on cartels, shipping millions of dollars of drugs into North America. One recent drug bust saw one and a half tonnes of cocaine seized from a speedboat with a street value of $200 million. In January, the president declared a state of emergency lasting 60 days and are uh, cracking down on powerful illegal gangs. Cartels in Ecuador control a thriving drugs trade and rely on access to the coast in many cities, including Esmeraldas. They use dozens of drug routes from Ecuador going north and they've recently been developing new routes to avoid detection, but armed marines are in pursuit. Our chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey joined the military on patrol off the coast of Esmeraldas in the third of his special reports. Armed Marines board fishing boats off Esmeraldas on Ecuador's Pacific coast. These intercepts are constant and part of the country's crackdown on cartel and gang activity. They're looking for drugs being smuggled to North America and abnormally large quantities of fuel the smugglers need for the journey north or signs of piracy. What they're looking for is not just necessarily drugs, oh, no, no, no. but it can actually be fuel as well. So some of the small fishing vessels can have um, fuel which will then be given to the fast boats that the drug users or the drug smugglers use. These are fairly random checks just to see if the paperwork's correct or not. An interceptor speedboat is launched on the move from a Coast Guard cutter 
as more Marines begin another Pacific Ocean patrol. This crew is looking for bigger and faster drug smuggling vessels that use these waters. We're sailing off the Galapagos Islands, its seas rich with marine life. But the drug dealers aren't interested in this place. They don't even come ashore. Rather, they seek the quieter waters to the south of the Galapagos with less maritime traffic. We join Commander Xavier Rubio's team on one of their regular patrols on the cutter Isla Isabella. His crew recently captured a smuggler boat with one and a half tons of cocaine on board with a street value of $200 million in Europe. Air Force surveillance cameras show the interceptor boat closing in on the smugglers. They maneuver into the target vessel's wake at high speed. They're using the waves as cover. The smugglers at this point don't know they're there. Then they're spotted and the smugglers attempt to accelerate away. But the Coast Guard anticipate the move and overtake them and cut across its bow. The Marines board the vessel, arrest the crew, and uncover their illegal cargo. A lot of people have discussed and I've, I've been reading about recently is that people who are using cocaine in, in North America or using cocaine in Europe and using cocaine in the UK, which is one of the big users, have no idea that it comes from somewhere and where it comes from, there are gangs, there's poverty, there's murder, there's death. People don't think about the consequences. I don't know if people think about that but we know that is one of the biggest business in the world and where the money is involved, bad people is involved. South American governments like Ecuador see taking the fight to the cartels and the gangs as their own war on terror. It will cost a fortune. This country sees this war as an actual fight for its survival. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Ecuador. Quick look at the weather for you. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Next few days bringing further rain, turning colder with hill snow likely. Southeastern quarter of England looks mild but wet through the rush hour. Elsewhere quite chilly, blustery showers running into western coasts. Southeast of England will see further patchy rain this morning while most other parts will have sunny spells and showers. Are we not fed up of the flipping rain? The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Feels like there's 78 days in February, doesn't there? Now, Vladimir Putin will deliver his annual address to Russia's Federal Assembly in just under an hour's time. Let's get more, should we? And um, taking you first of all to the former UK ambassador to Russia, that's Sir Laurie Bristow. Hi, Sir Laurie, it's good to see you. Thanks for taking the time to join us this morning. When he makes a speech, Morning. he does like to speak for um, quite a long time, and his tail is certainly up at the moment, given what's happened in Ukraine. So um, we should expect him to um, explore some of his favourite themes this morning. Um, I think, though, the context of the, uh, the speech this morning is what's important here. So we're about two weeks out from Russia's um, elections, where there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever um, who will be the next president of Russia for the next six years. Uh, but it's also happening uh, a bit over two years into Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Um, now, of course, that invasion was supposed to deliver victory in three days. It didn't. Two years on, Russia has taken huge losses. Uh, but my sense is that Mr. Putin thinks that the war is starting to go something of his way now, um, with some, um, you know, some tactical gains on the battlefield. Uh, but the all-important question of whether the U.S. Congress will release $61 billion of, uh, of the next tranche of aid for Ukraine. How surprised were you at Navalny's death, and particularly at this time? So I'm not in the least surprised by his uh, by his death. Um, I don't think we'll ever know the precise reasons for why he died exactly now, um, or probably not um, the exact reasons for why he died, you know, whether he was um, killed actively um, or through neglect. But the importance of Navalny here, of course, um, is that he represented hope to many Russians. Um, and um, in doing that, um, he made the Kremlin look corrupt and violent um, and incompetent, you know, through his incredibly successful use of social media. 
the Kremlin's objectives um, through um, the next couple of days, of course, he's being buried tomorrow um, in a, a suburb of Moscow, um, is to make Mr. Navalny look irrelevant. So essentially, the, the point of the speech today will be to underline the importance of Putin um, for everything that matters to Russians. So it'll be about demonstrating public support for Putin and his policies, that there is no alternative to Mr. Putin. Russia without Putin is unthinkable, um, and that Russia depends on Putin to stand up to a hostile West. Navalny's funeral will be tomorrow, should have been today, but they have decided because of the speech it has been postponed until tomorrow. His stoic wife speaking to European powers uh, to try to keep his memory alive. Um, will that in any way be the case, or will, as has been seen so often before, the waves um, fold over um, whoever uh, stands against Putin? So Mr. Navalny's um, uh, legacy, I, I think, certainly will be important in Russia. There are many Russians outside as well as inside Russia who oppose Mr. Navalny, uh, who oppose Mr. Putin, um, and like what Mr. Navalny stood for. I don't think that will lead um, to um, any uh, early change in Russia because the repression is so now so profound. Um, as, as you say, the election, the, the, uh, the burial has been moved to tomorrow. It will take place in a suburb of Moscow. Um, any attempt to demonstrate um, or to show support for Mr. Valny will be vigorously suppressed. This is part of a wider pattern. So um, earlier this week, Oleg Orlov, one of Russia's leading human rights activists, um, a Soviet-era dissident, was sent to prison for two and a half years for criticizing the military operation. A couple of days before that, it was the ninth anniversary of the murder just outside the Kremlin of Boris Nemtsov, um, who was the most charismatic um, of Putin's political opponents a decade ago. Um, so I, I think we should expect to see even more repression um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and as I said, this is about demonstrating that Russia without Putin is simply unthinkable. There is no alternative to Putin. So, Laurie, um, last night I was uh, spending some time with uh, colleagues from other news organisations much wiser than I on this topic, and they were suggesting that the only way forward with Ukraine was a negotiated settlement. What do you think? There may well be a negotiation one day. Uh, at present, I don't see that there is anything to negotiate with Mr Putin. He's made it abundantly clear for the last two years and in his most recent um, uh, public appearances, including the... Um, interview with Tucker Carlson, that essentially the only thing he's really interested in negotiating is the terms of Ukraine's surrender. Um, the Ukrainians are not going to surrender. Um, they, as far as I can see, um, intend to fight on because they know that their survival is at stake. So I think what matters here through this year um, is to make sure that we are supporting the Ukrainians, so releasing the, uh, the, the military support in Congress and from the Europeans and the UK and others, to enable the Ukrainians to defend themselves, and if, if there is ever a negotiation, to ensure that Ukraine goes into that in the strongest possible position. We must leave it there, Slory. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. NHS has launched a new campaign to encourage parents to vaccinate their children after a spike in measles cases. Amelia's here. What's going on? Well, this is an NHS campaign to try to reverse falling uh, vaccination uptake rates in the UK. And it's something that we've actually seen globally as well, according to the World Health Organization. So this features children asking their parents, have I been vaccinated and are my vaccines up to date? So why would you uh, have these routine vaccines? Well, children are then protected against 13 uh, diseases, some of which, like measles, can go on if not properly protected to cause uh, serious health complications and problems. But as I just mentioned overall there's been a decline uh, globally really uh, in uptake rates for childhood vaccines and uh, in the UK this is partly being put down to parental complacency and also partly uh, vaccine hesitancy and the World Health Organization sets a target level for 95% uh, uptake in order to provide that adequate level of protection but in the UK for 22 and 2023 that uh, target was not met uh, at all and this, of course, comes off the back of seeing a rise in measles cases. Now, in the last hour, you asked, well, haven't we seen measles being eradicated? Well, 
Uh, the UK achieved that status in 2017, but then lost it um, a year later. And ever since, it's become a, a continued problem and a growing problem. Um, the main uh, hub of cases really are in Birmingham and the West Midlands for measles. 605 cases, uh, according to the UK Health Security Agency uh, across the UK. So uh, it's a, an increasing... Uh, oh, sorry, 650. So it's been an increasing problem, but this is really a campaign that is urging parents to get their children vaccinated if they haven't been. And one of the issues, particularly in that part of the country, is the pork product that was part of the vaccination, I believe. But there is an alternative, which is a vegan alternative, that uh, can be uh, asked for if parents go to the, the doctor's surgery. That's right. And if there are any concerns, health professionals are urging people to seek advice on the NHS website or just talk to their doctor if they do have any worries, like you say. OK, for now, Amelia, thanks very much indeed. Still to come on The Breakfast Show for you. Uh, is now the time to reignite the assisted dying debate in the UK. We'll hear from campaigners on both sides of the argument. Together, forever, except on holiday, we'll look at why a growing number of travellers are choosing to leave their other halves behind. And fed up of traffic jams, soon you'll be able to fly over them if you've got a fat wallet. and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? You I am angry. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Mom, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to get in, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to your award-winning news channel. Mm -hmm. Tell us more. <laughs> seven well, yeah, years on the bounce. Seven years in a row, Kay. And even more awards as well, because we've got politics team. That's what, 
Award. Yeah, yeah. Beth Rigby, Political yes. Journalist of the Year. And Westminster Accounts for Innovation. Yes, wow. with Sam Coates. Yeah. I mean, and Tortoise was a collaboration between Sky and Tortoise together. Exactly. And it takes a massive team as well, doesn't it? From camera yeah. operators to floor managers to everybody that doesn't get to sit and speak out loud. So, huge team effort, but consistent as well. Seven years is remarkable. Yeah, and I think we had a sort of a year where we didn't win, and before that it was another seven or eight years. So, yeah. You're in the right place. <laughs> Certainly are. The right place for the top stories yes. this morning as well. Dame Esther Ranson has made a renewed call for MPs to debate the law on assisted dying. Uh, intervention comes as MPs warn the law in different parts of the UK is likely to diverge with the Isle of Man set to become the first part of the British Isles to legalise assisted dying. Parents in England who take their children out of school without permission are going to face higher fines of £80. The Education Minister, Damien Hines, told this show a few moments ago that parents who don't pay could eventually face prosecution. He hoped the measure would improve attendance. The United States Supreme Court says it will rule on whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution over the January 6th Capitol riots. Meanwhile, the former president's campaign team has said he will appeal a court ruling in Illinois, which will remove him from the state's primary ballot next month. Health experts say children are suffering needlessly because fewer parents are opting to get them vaccinated. The UK Health Security Agency is launching a new campaign to try and boost uptake. I want to debate assisted dying this morning. Baroness Finlay is here with us, as is Sarah Wotton. Ladies, thank you both for joining us. Um, I wonder if we may start with you, um, Baroness. Uh, talk to me about your views. Well, <clears throat> we, we had the report that came out today. And it's really interesting, they've done an in-depth report and they are not recommending that Parliament looks to change the law. They've got lots of evidence and they do refer to the Danish Parliament report, which actually did a similar exercise and having looked at Netherlands and Oregon, they've advised the Denmark Parliament not to legislate because it is just too dangerous. Sarah? So, yeah, just, just to correct to Laura there on a couple of points, it was never in the terms of reference of this inquiry that they would rec recommend for or against a change in the law. What they have said is that law change in the British Isles is increasingly likely and that the government must engage because Jersey or the Isle of Man, possibly Scotland, is going to legalise assisted dying and that could create an inequality for patients and they need to engage with that. Just on, just on, on Denmark, yeah. though, I just want to correct that as well because it was actually an ethics committee that is feeding into the Danish Parliament's yeah, inquiry and they haven't yet made a decision. But, I mean, we know that 400 million people have access to these laws now worldwide. There's an increasing law change. Ireland's doing an inquiry. France is about to, to bring a law in this summer. And that's for a reason, Kay. It's because people are dying differently now to the way they even did just 10 years ago. And patients want choice at the end of life. Uh, the, the report was so clear about patient agency being necessary. Well, the report is certainly clear, too, that our palliative care services need a lot more support that we have areas without palliative care adequately provided in the UK. And we still have this situation where about two-thirds of hospice funding is coming from people doing marathon runs and cape sales and from the voluntary sector. So, really, some people are saying, well, we're not going to state-fund having palliative care services and hospice services, which is what people desperately need. 24-7, they need it. And we're going to otherwise consider state funding their lives being ended. And there are huge dangers. Interestingly, although they don't refer to it in this report, in Holland, the person who took their legislation through later on said they got it the wrong way around. They should have got palliative care sorted out first. So and that's Kay, can I just really come in important. On palliative care? Um, so I think this is actually one thing that Elora and I do agree on, that, that there should be more funding for palliative care. And she's right that the report did recommend more funding for it. But they were also absolutely explicit that even the best palliative care 
can't help everybody. Some people's suffering is beyond its reach. And interestingly, it also pointed out that where it has been legalised, palliative care improves. improves. So £72 million Australian dollars has been invested in Victoria. And in Oregon, nine out of ten people have palliative care. So what I'm saying is that we should have both. We should have excellent palliative care and for the small number of people who it doesn't help, and we know that's 17 people a day who suffer even with the best palliative care, then there should be the choice of assisted dying. Kate, uh, thank you for raising that, because actually, <clears throat> around the whole world, palliative care has increased because there's been a huge move to educate. But in those countries that have legislated, the increase hasn't been as great, and in fact, several of these countries have dropped down in their rankings internationally of palliative care compared to countries that haven't legislated. The other difficulty is, you can throw money at something, it's the quality of care that matters. And there haven't been agreed international measures about quality of care. And the report here flags up in Oregon that failure to collect adequate data, the gaps that there are, the fact that the research that should be done clearly hasn't been done because they're not even collecting the data. It seems to be even voluntary. They should report after a death but there is no mandatory requirement to report. So, Elora's moving on to the how, and I think we are in that place now. This isn't a question of whether, this is a question of when. Um, so, we, we can't go down the sort of the rabbit hole of data. The critical thing here is what the report was very clear, is it's going to be legalised here, and we need to look at that. I think that we've got the, the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition saying that time must be made for this debate. It's absolutely clear. The public supports this. Huge numbers. It's a unifying issue. So uh, th this unites people from left to right, wherever they live in the country. It's very clear to parliamentarians the most dangerous thing we can do now is nothing, and that this, this will come back. I expect in the next general election for uh, voters to ask their candidates where they stand on assisted dying, because are they going to support choice at the end of life, which is the next big social progress in this country, or are they going to defend an, a increasingly outdated status quo? Actually, when you look at the public's awareness, it's interesting that only 43% of the public realise that this means giving lethal drugs. Most people think that it's either hospice care or being able to stop treatment, which is what they can do now. What we really have to do is make sure that we have palliative care services adequately available to everyone so they have real choice. There's no point having no adequate services and feeling driven into death. And looking at the data and some of the evidence put into that report, uh, there are people in these other countries who have had their lives ended for really social reasons. Loneliness has no. gone up and um, autism... Um, the, it's referred to in the report. No, they're, they're the really clear that there is no slippery slope when you get to a terminal illness law. They're absolutely clear I about that. They knock that they out. They're that. also very clear that, that. Um, in our countries, these laws are working well. That no country that has ever ever and passed this legislation has ever repealed it, because it's safer to have the scrutiny and transparency of decision making it than have a, a sort of blanket ban and a Wild West situation, which is what we have in the UK at the moment. So if you were really concerned about patient safety, you'd be concerned about the one Briton going to Switzerland to have an assisted death every week, people taking matters into their own hands here, taking increasingly... Uh, that some of them are suffering. I mean, Esther herself said, "Why? how is it fair that she has to go to Switzerland when her family may be prosecuted, that her choices are limited? Wouldn't it be better to legislate in this area and have proper transparency around that? And, and if you're going to legislate, you have to make sure that it is safe for everybody. And that report is very clear that there is great variation around the world. There is no consistency in the way even data is collected and the thing that they well, we can, didn't... Well, we can do that, Laura. No, we can, hang we, on. We, yeah, hang, but we can, hang we can on. collect data. And, of course, they there have... are different models around the world, but we can learn from that. And right. I, I and think... that, is, that is exactly what this report is trying to do. It's laying yes, out it's... the different models and saying, right, look at them really carefully, but they did not come out recommending any one model. And when you read the way they that they really describe... They were really clear that a terminal when you... illness model provides a way forward for the British Isles. They recognised you cannot... You, you cannot 
ideological clearly defined. opposition no, to I legalisation. Don't. But what That's I'm saying to you fair. is that you, you should join no, us don't. and construct the law that is best for the British Isles. When you put, that is the best way forward for, for dying people. You should be listening to your Sarah, patients. Your say, patients are suffering at the end of life. Sarah, I'm, Some of them. My patients, I'm looking after and trying to improve their quality of life every moment of every day. That's what we should be doing for our people. Yes, but your Not own evidence... allowing them to be driven... Your in own a, evidence, into... Laura, they caught... The, the report showed that your own evidence admitted that some people are beyond the reach of even the best palliative care. The Office there of is... Health Economics quantified those numbers. They said that no, 17 that people a day and, and... would suffer. There are 600,000 people that die, ev die every year in this country, I and 6,000 of them would there... suffer. There is, there is nothing in medicine that is 100%. There is nothing in law that is 100%. If we're going to look at any change in the law, we have to say what is the safest for the whole of the population. And this report, in its detail, is flagging up a lot of concerns coming out of these countries where they have changed the law. And at yeah. the moment, it is too dangerous you have your group have put down legislation proposed in the uk we have looked at trying to amend it to improve it nobody has come to discuss all of those amendments with us there has been open dialogue we, we there have, have been suggestions we have, we have discussed this a lot happened. and we've discussed it in the house of lords where there hasn't been parliamentary time given to this bill yes, so it yes. hasn't progressed something's come and that is yeah. what the prime minister and the leader of the opposition have been clear that this issue does need parliamentary time and it should be revisited in the next parliament and there should be a vote because this has gone on too long and it's causing people to suffer at the end of life and it's a massive patient safety issue you have a problem with legalising assisted dying. What I am saying, and Dignity in Dying is saying, is that we should have both. We should have excellent palliative care and we should have the choice of assisted dying. It brings huge peace of mind to people when they're diagnosed with a terminal illness. We will all die and knowing that we have choice at the end of life would help us hugely there in that been, process. You know perfectly well there have been suggestions of ways to look at improving care, improving care at the end of life, and so on. Those certainly are discussions that need to be had, and this report makes it very clear. This is a very, very complex subject, the, and there isn't a simple, straightforward answer. The report, but it has to be safe. On another occasion, later. thank you, so Kay. Sorry thank we're you, out Kay. Of time. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you very much, Kay. Thank, thank you. you. Let's see. Uh, let's bring in Wilf now. Hi, Wilf. Good morning to you. Uh, what's uh, catching your eye for later? Well, that debate did. I mean, two very uh, impressive sides of a very complicated argument, isn't it? It's, it's very hard to know where, where the right side of that is. Um, uh, so that's the only call my eye. But... Uh, we've got quite a lot of live events coming up in, in the show today. Uh, first up is uh, President Putin's annual address to both Houses of Parliament. Now, that starts at 9 o'clock in uh, your time. It will almost certainly still be going when my time starts because he tends to go on for about 90 minutes plus uh, in this annual address. So we'll bring the headlines um, from that. Uh, we'll also be getting those immigration numbers crossing just at the back end of your show and we'll be uh, analysing that. But most notably today uh, is the first part of a two-part inquiry into the issues raised by the conviction of uh, former Met police officer Wayne Cousins, of course, who was convicted for the murder of Sarah Everard of uh, September 2021. And uh, Dame uh, Elish Angioli will be holding a press conference at 10.30. We'll have that. Really interesting to, to see what those conclusions are. And we'll actually got a great guest, Zoe Bellingham, the former HM inspector of Constabulary at uh, 11 o'clock to, to react to that press conference. OK. Those RTS awards behind you there. And they are. I was, you know, I was thinking, is there enough space on this uh, pillar? I'll have it I'm looking over the wrong shoulder, the confusing thing about television, uh, to fit in another three. Although I was thinking we need space for three, but I guess we don't because Sam and okay. Beth will proudly, I imagine, hold theirs uh, on their mantelpieces at home. So we just need space for one more. Which yeah, well, is. here it is. I'll have it carried up to you later on. Well, it's very sweet to have it carried up to me. I think you should probably put the name of the bosses uh, on and the uh, entire wider team who, uh, of course, deserve the credit uh, for And that. everybody else that knows me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we'll see you in the next hour. We'll see you later. Thank you. See ya. Still to come on The Breakfast Show for you. The couples who live together but holiday apart. More on that on the latest travel trend with Claire Irvin next. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy and a 
a very special day for some. Happy birthday to those celebrating today on this leap year, including some celebrity names. So it's a comedy improvisation show, so we ask the audience for suggestions and then we make stuff up based on what they say. So they're a part of the show. I do that us. for a living. Yes. <laughs> so do we. So do we. <laughs> you do sometimes, I mean, there is sometimes we play a game where we ask people to write down lines of dialogue and because it's sort of anonymous, sometimes people write down things and think, mm, no, that's yeah. not, that's not going to be funny. You know. Filthy, filthy thing. Or if there's a very bad tragic story in the news, you know that's not something that you're going to get any laughs from or, or you would want to. Um, but, it, but, but also, as well, when you ask people to shout out suggestions, they, also, they sometimes shout out things like, you say, could I have a place of work? And they'll say, abattoir. And you go, well, that's, yeah. oh, that's not going <laughs> to... Yeah. You know, there's not going to be much fun in that. That's part of what I think entertainment can be, is an escape from the real world for a while, a kind of... A, a kind of sort of relaxation away from it, a kind of sort of refresher so that you're not always constantly thinking about what's in the news, because let's face it, the news by its very nature is, is usually pretty, pretty grim. You constantly feel slightly nervous or excited. It depends how you view it. I think it's exciting mm -hmm. um, and it slips into nerves if you haven't done a show for a while mm. or if there's somebody in that you particularly want to impress. But mostly, it's just exciting. It's a, a good adrenaline ride. The first time when I started doing improvised comedy back in the 80s, I did quite a bit of work with Mike Myers, who went to, you know, people were know from Austin Powers and Wayne's World. And he was so fluent at what he did that I remember just looking at him thinking, I can see you doing it, but it still seems impossible. But of course, after a few months of practice and experience, you, you start to not be as good as him, but you start to be as fluent. The great thing about sort of the improvised comedy thing is like you have a comic idea and you do it and you find out straight away in comedy, you find out straight away whether it's funny or not because the audience tells you by laughing. Um, you can have a comedy idea, write it down on a piece of paper, hand it to somebody, a, a TV organisation, not hear anything for about a year and it comes back with not funny stamped on it, you know. <laughs> Whereas with this, you can immediately get that, that rapport and, and, and that instant reaction. At the Comedy Store in London. OK. Yes. How long for? Well, we start on Wednesday, March the 6th and then we keep going. It's a residency. Yeah, improv. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're there every Wednesday at Paul some Mer point. Paul Suki Webster's improv show. Yeah. That's what it's called. At some point we'll take a break, mm. but for now we're there every Wednesday at the Comedy Store. She was on holiday last week, but she is back. Claire Ovin is here from the Times and Sunday Times, of course, head of travel. Lots to talk about. Not sure if we can Lots fit it all about. in. <laughs> Not least whether you're happily married, but you holiday alone. Yeah, live together, holiday apart. That's a thing. Um, and it's kind of just, you know, it, when you think about it, it's very natural. You may love somebody, but you may not love how they like to go on holiday. So many couples are choosing to uh, a holiday separately. Now that could mean going away. I mean, there's lots of reasons behind it. Um, you know, you might want to have a break from kids and give each other um, a bit of time off. One of you, you might like skiing, the other one doesn't. Uh, yes, this, this may happen. It does <laughs> in, in my household. Um, and or, you know, you actually, one of you likes traveling and the other doesn't. But there is a trend for people, or indeed, somebody I was speaking to earlier this week, goes on holiday with her partner, but they do different things when they're away. So one will head to the spa, the other will go off and do something maybe a little bit more intrepid. But, um, yeah, increasingly, couples are realising that they don't have to grin and bear it, but they can actually just go away and do what they want to. What would Charlie say? Uh, Charlie and I spent yesterday planning holidays together. So, we, you know, we're... we're but I've, I've enjoyed going on holiday by myself, you know, prior to us being married. And it's quite empowering, I think, to go and explore the world by yourself. I know it's not the easiest for everybody, but I quite liked it. So is this trend people going on holiday completely alone or just without their other half with other people? 
It could be either. OK, cos yeah. I, I mean, I go away without my husband all the time. The yeah. majority of my husband... My majority of my holidays are not with my husband. Right. It's quite rare. Um, but I don't know going on holiday completely alone. I would be nervous to try that. I, I would, would, I'd love to try it and just be that person. Solo travelling is cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's my guilty pleasure. Yeah. I mean, I love eating alone as well. Yeah, you, you. Yeah. 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 yeah, I um, I went to Machu Picchu. As you know, you have to be very careful how you say that. You have to be careful. Because I'm going to if follow you say you. if you say Machu Picchu, it means something completely different. Okay. <laughs> Don't say that to locals because <laughs> they titter at you. Um, they've got real problems with flooding there at the moment. They have, they have, um, and you know it's yet another blow to their tourist industry, um, frankly. Um, but also, I mean, of course, very serious weather um, uh, situations, climate change, El Nino, El Nina um, I have a wreaking havoc um, around the world uh, this year, tends to be the year following El Nino. But um, yeah, I mean, you can see there, um, just drought followed by these rainfalls is, is creating these horrendous conditions. And, um, you know, not least, of course, for, for travellers who, um, as as you have done, Kay, you know, um, Machu Inca Trail. Picchu, yeah, Picchu, the Inca Trail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is um, you know, it, it's it's way up there on on list of people's wish lists. You know, it's a great adventure, um, something many people want to do, and you know, the thought of these kind of weather fronts, um, it, it, you know, it may be off putting to yeah. people. Yeah, and and the capital actually doesn't have any drainage on the streets because mm. it just the last time it rained was 1978 or something. It just doesn't rain in that part of the world, and yeah. that, is, that is changing. But if you've never done the Inca Trail, you should. I'd love it's to. It's properly hard. Yeah. Have you done it? No. Not no. interested? No. You could tell he was not interested then, I, do, I like So I like going and having... I, I just fear that there would be too many other people on the trail. So when I went to Sweden... I went and walked into the wilderness for five days by myself on wild camp solo, never saw anybody for five days. Loved it. The idea of kind of having to wait behind somebody or feel as though you're holding somebody back because they... I quite like kind of hiking solo. So you it's don't very like carefully other controlled, though, isn't it? it? Is. I mean, I think, it is. Um, yeah. and yeah, it really uh, people are going with tour operators as well. And, you know, this trend for people to travel with more support, which these kind of conditions, um, you know, has only helped accessibility. Um, yeah, it just means that you hopefully will be paying for an experience where you're not necessarily. Yeah, there was certainly, the yeah, I was, I, I, you know, I was struggling for breath and nobody could hear me, basically, <laughs> on the Inca Trail because there, was, there weren't that many people there at the time. As you say, it's very limited uh, per day. Uh, talk, me, talk to me about flights in Spain. In Spain, yes. Trains, not planes in Spain. Um, Spain is following in France's footsteps. So you may remember last year, France um, limited or banned flights under two hours. Um, Spain's banned uh, flights under two and a half hours. And uh, this is a kind of, uh, hopefully will be more successful than France's bid, which ended up with just three flight routes being um, affected. <laughs> uh, but right. Spain, of course, benefits from this amazing high-speed rail network, um, you know, two and a half thousand miles of high-speed um, networks. And you can pretty much get to any city in Spain for under three hours from Madrid. Um, so uh, travellers will be taking advantage of that um, once this ban comes that into place. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd, I love trains. I would love to go interrailing. I, it's so much more relaxing than mm, flying. Yeah. I find flying these days, it's a bit of a hassle. There's so many rules and luggage. And mm. if I could, I would do like a big kind of European interrailing trip one day. I'd love to do that. Have you ever been on the train to Glen Eagles? No. Five and a half hours from London. Mm. Actually, to Glen Eagles. No, I've to never. I've been on the train from uh, up to Edinburgh, up to Glasgow, mm. but never Glen Eagles. Mm. And I love, I love a long train yeah. journey. I had the, the pleasure of the old Caledonian sleeper before it was oh, wow. refurbished and all of the lights in the carriages were broken so there was those siloom sticks you know the military use they kind of cracked up and they were hanging from each carriage as you kind of oh, went down cool. it it kind of added to kind of the Hogwarts kind of feel about it but the new the new refurbished service looks incredible mm. it looks incredible yes I think if you can get it to work <laughs> Even yeah. better. I'm going to show off now and say that I had my 40th birthday on the Orient Express. Moving on. Um, best places to stay in the UK? Yeah, we um, every year, uh, the Times and Sunday Times um, looks at all the hotels in the UK and decides which are the best. So it's a really rigorous process. Well, I can't tell you that right now. Oh. It's going to be announced tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Um, we'll be telling you, but can I? It's very exciting. Um, there's a huge amount of work what and expertise. What criteria do you use? 
Well, um, there's kind of, it's a mixture of the tangible and the intangible. Um, it's a team of experts, spends all year going around hotels, poor them. And um, Can it's I volunteer next like... year? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be part of that team, job, Kay. That <laughs> Yeah, it's a good job. Um, so we'll be looking at things like accessibility, really, really important. Um, and it's not about, um, you know, just having a ramp somewhere. It's about lighting. It's about how you are inclusively welcoming your, your staff. Do your facilities do what they say on the tin? Um, is your food delicious, if not Michelin starred? Is it wonderful? Um, are your interiors lovely? And is it well kept and a lovely place to be? But then, of course, there's the intangible. You know, has that hotel got personality? Um, what's the service like? Is it intuitive? Is it, um, you know, you may have service, but if it's over the top, that's just as bad as really awful service. So these are the kind of intangible um, factors that is, uh, they are hotly debated, I can tell you, in the, um, in the newsroom, in the run-up to Best Places, and we will be announcing it tomorrow. What do you look for? What do I look for? Things that you can't get at home. I think you, yeah. you want that level of service or you want that facility whether that's a spa or a pool or something something that I can't do myself because otherwise why am I there mm. okay. I love really good service really just brilliant service what like, does that constitute well you know like when people just double checking you know when you're in America and they never ever let your glass go empty they're always straight there you take them one sip and they will fill your glass with water I love that kind of thing just feeling completely I pampered Really? Leave me alone. I Leave love me it. Alone. <laughs> oh no, no, that would drive me nuts. I love Leave it. Leave me with the bottle. Yeah. That, okay, <laughs> that I respect. <laughs> what about you? What what floats your boat? Um, well, I just like a sense of generosity. So when you arrive somewhere that you aren't feeling like every single thing that happens or that you do is being, you know, ticked off and added to your bill. Mm. I don't. It's not about having things for free. It's just that sense of you're being welcomed as a guest as opposed to um, uh, a commodity. OK. Um, 29th of February today. Yes. Celebrating people's birthdays. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. We were talking earlier, Claire, about whether you would celebrate on the 28th of February or the 1st of March, because quite often it's not on a form, so you have to choose one or the other. Um, well, yeah, I'd have to look at the astrology around that before I decided. Same. The same. Um, both. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, amongst others celebrating today, Sir Lucian Grange, um, head of Universal Music. Um, he is mentioned in The Times today. And we also, there he is, with his Hollywood uh, star, Walk of Fame. And you find a couple, four. Yeah, quadruplets, if you can imagine, born on the 29th of February. So it's in the Daily Mail. And they're turning three, even though they're technically 12-year-olds. Uh -huh. <laughs> something like a one in three and a half million chance of that happening, there of having quadruplets. Not yours till March. Not mine till March. OK. <laughs>
morning, everybody. It is nine o'clock, and you are watching the Royal Television Society News Channel of the Year. Seven years in a row. <laughs> 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 <Ooh -hoo. laughs> <laughs> yep. That. Uh, coming up on today's programme, Esther Ransom makes a new call for MPs to vote on assisted dying. We'll talk to her daughter Rebecca in just a few minutes. Plus, the government's plans to improve school attendance, higher fines and potentially prosecution for parents whose children miss class. And a lovely bunch of coconuts will be talking Cockney accents with a real-life pearly king. <laughs> it's Thursday the 29th of February. We report from the Isle of Man, which looks set to become the first part of the British Isles to legalise assisted dying. But at the point where he got that bad, it was too late to starve himself Do to death. Do you want to see a change in the law? Desperately. I don't want to see anybody suffer like Simon did. The US Supreme Court says it will rule on whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution over the 6th of January Capitol riots. Doctors warn children are suffering needlessly with dangerous diseases like measles because parents aren't having them vaccinated. I'm going to need a little privacy so you guys can blow. Not blow. Blow! One of America's best-loved comedians, Richard Lewis, has died at the age of 76. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy and what's it like to have a birthday in a leap year? We'll tell you who's celebrating. with us this morning again you've been here more often than i have this week almost <laughs> you've been to the isle of man i have been to the isle of man we've been looking at the the very divisive and emotive subject of assisted dying the isle of man is very close to introducing legislation which would make it probably the first place in the british isles jersey is quite close as well uh, considering changing its laws to allow assisted dying on on those territories that will have an impact on the rest of the British Isles and there's been a government um, Home Affairs Select Committee report into assisted dying which stops short of saying that the government must introduce legislation at, or recommending change but saying that the debate needs to be had. It's a very, very divisive issue. Emotions run high on both sides and this is what they say on the Isle of Man. What can you do? Can you do me sis? Oh. Sue's dogs are her distraction. A distraction from the pain and the loss after months of sitting at her dying husband's bedside. In July 2021, Simon was diagnosed with the most aggressive form of motor neurone disease. He developed serious stomach complications and a chronic bed sore. I eventually said to the nurse, you know, why is this so bad? Why can't you get rid of it? And she said, I'm sad to say that Simon is decomposing while he's still alive. As Simon grew weaker, he took what little action he could to speed up the inevitable. He stopped eating. He'd chosen to starve himself to death if it carried on any longer. But at the point where he got that bad, it was too late to starve himself Do to death. Do you want to see a change in the law? Desperately. I don't want to see anybody suffer like Simon did. So this is the House of Keys, our, our Parliament on the Isle of Man. In parliaments across the British Isles, formal and informal talks are taking place to see if and how assisted dying can be legalised. Nowhere is closer to making it a reality than here on the Isle of Man. As people become more um, au fait with how assisted dying works, as they actually see it in practice and get the right training and support, more and more people see the benefits of it. The proposed bill would make assisted dying available to patients who meet a strict criteria. They must be adults who have the capacity to make decisions for themselves. Residents must have spent more than a year living on the Isle of Man. They must be suffering from a terminal illness where there is no likelihood of improvement and expected to die within six months. The proposals would see assisted dying provided through the island's health system, with doctors potentially offered 
an opt-in clause. It's the people with vulnerability that I'm most concerned about that may be coerced, um, maybe feel a perception of being worthless and not want to be here, maybe feel that not being a burden to their family is the right answer. And it's these vulnerable people in society that I feel may be sucked into assisted dying. Whatever happens here on the Isle of Man has no direct bearing on the rest of the British Isles. But it does show that some very difficult conversations are taking place. And if the assisted dying law is passed here, well, that could propel change elsewhere. All sides accept that this difficult debate must happen. It's about who has control over your life and death. Ready. It's such a challenging um, topic, debate, isn't it? If people do want to go to the Alamo, it's a way off yet, yeah, potentially, but if people do want to go, they, they need to leave, live there for a year? You have to have residential status for at least a year, and there is a really uh, very strict set of criteria. They're very keen to make sure it's not seen as a destination, as a, a death island tourism, which is... And, and Jersey has, has the same stipulation. Um, but it, it's, it's some way off, but they're still trying to find a way would, that would keep all parties happy. Yeah, we're chatting to Esther Ranson's daughter um, coming up shortly. I was going to bring you the top stories this yes, morning. Please. Let's start with the US Supreme Court, which has said that it will rule on whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution over the Capitol riots in January 2021. Meanwhile, the former president has also been removed from the ballot in a third US state. Mark Stone is in Washington and has more on the Illinois judge's decision. Uh, the judge has decided to remove him because uh, the, the judge believes he is an insurrectionist. It follows a very similar decision made in Colorado late last year uh, and in the state of Maine. Uh, now, that decision is stayed, as it's known, it is paused uh, until a, a bigger decision can be made by the Supreme Court here in Washington, D.C., over whether or not states have the right to remove candidates from the ballot. That's that. The other potentially much more significant development is, it, is a, an announcement by the Supreme Court uh, last night that they will hear the, the case uh, of whether or not Donald Trump is immune from prosecution. Now, this relates to the most serious of all the cases against Donald Trump. That is the federal case here in Washington related to his involvement in the January the 6th protest, riots, insurrection, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the decision uh, by the Supreme Court that they will make a judgment over whether or not Donald Trump uh, is immune from prosecution delays the case. It delays the federal case, a case that was due to start any time now, will now be delayed uh, until the summer at the very earliest. Now, what that means uh, is that potentially, if it's happening in the summer, it's so close to the election itself that it will be delayed until after the election. That will mean that the American people do not get to hear a case against a former president accused of the most serious of crimes, insurrection, until after the point at which they potentially choose him to be their next president. A new study has linked ultra-processed foods to poor mental health. Products such as sugary breakfast cereals, ready meals and fizzy drinks were associated with a 48 to 53 per cent greater risk of developing anxiety. Researchers are calling for policies which encourage people to eat healthier foods. Actor and comedian and star of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Richard Lewis, has died at the age of 76. I'm going to need a little privacy so you guys can blow. Not blow. Blow! Lewis was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2023. His co-star, Larry David, paid tribute to him as the rare combination of funny and sweet. He's also known for his role as Prince John in the classic Robin Hood Men in Tights. And now for some news about us. For the seventh consecutive year, Sky News has won the News Channel of the Year at the Royal Television Society Awards. The jury said that Sky was given the award for the comprehensive way it covered the main news stories of the year, both in the UK and around the world. Political editor Beth Rigby was also awarded Political Journalist of the Year, being described as the standout winner. Sky News also took home the Innovation Award for its joint data project with Tortoise Media, Westminster Accounts. And there it is. There it is. Woo. Yeah. Take, you have to clean it all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's easily dirty, cos as soon as you touch it... Yeah. Fingerprints everywhere. And then it all reflects what inside a, itself. Yeah, what a nice problem to have, as we were saying. It's a great problem to Seven have. Seven years on the bounce. 
incredible work. But consistency as well, that's the thing that really stands out, is it's not just a flash in the pan success, it's consistent work from a huge team of people. Mm. And congratulations to, huge congratulations both to mm. Beth, who has been previously nominated, yes. but won last night. Fantastic speech that she gave as well. Uh, and also to Sam, yes. the deputy, who also won. He also won as well for Westminster Accounts. Yeah. And it, you know, it ruffled a lot of feathers, the Westminster Accounts. It annoyed a lot of MPs. Uh, I but I was on the receiving end of quite uh, a lot of it. I know, I know. <laughs> but, but, but it was a great piece of work and it's needed. It it's public service journalism mm. and that's what we're here for. Exactly that, exactly that. And he's now travelling up to Rochdale for reporting on that in due course as well. So he is. Busy couple of yeah, days. Yeah, of course, Rochdale by election today. Extensive coverage of that tomorrow. Mm. Uh, other news for you. The government has announced plans for higher fines of £80 for parents in England who take their children out of school without permission. Want to have your thoughts on that after we hear from the Education Minister. What happens if parents don't pay? Well, as with fines in general, as, as you know, there is a system that you... Uh, th th that you go through. Um, if you don't pay uh, within the 21 days, the, the amount goes up. Ultimately, of course, non-payment of fines result, can, can result in, in proceedings as it can for other fines. But that's not where we want to be. I mean, we don't want people paying these fines at all. We want, we want the children Whoa, to be... Let me just check what you're saying. School. Are you saying that if the parents don't pay, eventually they could face prosecution? So, it, it, look, it's a legal requirement to have that's a suitable, a yes, to have though, a suitable education for your child. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, not, that's not a new announcement we're making no, today, no, Kay. That's, that has long been, that's long been the case. What the penalties will be. We have, look, the other thing to say is we have what we call a support-first approach. So you're talking about uh, fixed penalty notices for unauthorised absence. That's far down the line. We want to be working with, with families, and schools do an amazing job. Uh, having sensitive conversations, encouraging conversations with parents and with pupils themselves. Noting how much I blink there, that's when I'm concentrating. Yeah. It's a cognitive yeah. thing, isn't no, it, do. when you blink a lot, when yeah. you're focusing. I think also, so they say, if you look up, you're more of a creative thinker, so you're visually thinking as you're looking up when you're thinking. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, I've been What told. did you think about what he had to say? Well, as I look up, Kay... <laughs> <laughs> I thought, actually, it was interesting what he was saying. I mean, they're increasing the fines from 60 to £80. Pounds. The fines then go up even more if you don't pay them within a short period of time. And then that can lead to prosecution. And so we can potentially have a situation where uh, parents could be prosecuted if they uh, don't, uh, you know, they pull their kids out of school for any reason, whatever it might be, for a few days. And I think some people might feel that's really quite a, a large escalation, but it's the government really trying to demonstrate how seriously they're taking uh, the level of absence. Uh, this is a problem, the government, you know, keeps saying this has happened partly because of COVID, but this was a problem before COVID, and you did point that out to Damien Hines when you asked him about this. Uh, and, and I think, you know, he kept saying, ah, oh, you know, that's a problem for a later date, you know, that, that'll be down the line, we don't really want to talk about that, let's just focus on what we're doing now. But nonetheless, I mean, that would be a very shocking thing to happen if a parent were to be prosecuted for quite a small fine uh, and then going to court. So I think... Some people are saying it's not going to work. Some people are saying fines are not the way to get absence to reduce. They're saying in a cost of living crisis, some vulnerable families that are already on the breadline could be pushed into debt by these fines. And so some people say it's not a good idea. The General Secretary of the National Education Union has said there's no evidence whatsoever to prove that this would actually work on reducing school absence. But nonetheless, the government are trying to say they're doing something, we're doing something, but there's no extra money for this. OK, well, let's see what happens. There might be from the fines. Mm. Um... Yeah, well, that's true. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for now, Murray. Thank you. Uh, Sky News has joined Ecuador's Navy patrols who are cracking down on cartels shipping millions of dollars of drugs into North America. One recent bus saw one and a half tonnes of cocaine seized from a speedboat with a street value of $200 million. In the third of his special reports, our chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey joined the military on patrol off the coast of Esmeraldas. Armed Marines board fishing boats off Esmeraldas on Ecuador's Pacific coast. These intercepts are constant and part of the country's crackdown on cartel and gang activity. They're looking for drugs being smuggled to North America and abnormally large quantities of fuel the smugglers need for the journey north or signs of piracy. What they're looking for is not just necessarily drugs, oh, no, no, no. but it can actually be fuel as well. So some of the small fishing vessels can have um, fuel which will then be given to the fast boats that the drug users or the drug smugglers use. 
these are fairly random checks, just to see if the paperwork's correct or not. An interceptor speedboat is launched on the move from a Coast Guard cutter as more Marines begin another Pacific Ocean patrol. This crew is looking for bigger and faster drug smuggling vessels that use these waters. We're sailing off the Galapagos Islands, its seas rich with marine life. But the drug dealers aren't interested in this place. They don't even come ashore. Rather, they seek the quieter waters to the south of the Galapagos with less maritime traffic. We join Commander Xavier Rubio's team on one of their regular patrols on the cutter Isla Isabella. His crew recently captured a smuggler boat with one and a half tons of cocaine on board with a street value of $200 million in Europe. Air Force surveillance cameras show the interceptor boat closing in on the smugglers. They maneuver into the target vessel's wake at high speed. They're using the waves as cover. The smugglers at this point don't know they're there. Then they're spotted and the smugglers attempt to accelerate away. But the Coast Guard anticipate the move and overtake them and cut across its bow. The Marines board the vessel, arrest the crew and uncover their illegal cargo. A lot of people have discussed and I've, I've been reading about recently is that people who are using cocaine in, in North America or using cocaine in Europe and using cocaine in the UK, which is one of the big users, have no idea that it comes from somewhere and where it comes from there are gangs, there's poverty, there's murder, there's death. People don't think about the consequences. I don't know if people think about that, but we know that is one of the biggest business in the world and where the money is involved, bad people is involved. South American governments like Ecuador see taking the fight to the cartels and the gangs as their own war on terror. It will cost a fortune. This country sees this war as an actual fight for its survival. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Ecuador. Let's take you to the Russian parliament now, where President Putin is speaking. And we see that the choice to support us is unswerving, despite all the losses. And this is in the interests of not only the entire country, but uh, the benefit of humanity as a whole. And we have shown flexibility and sustainability in developing our industry to these ends. And we have seen that our compatriots are involved in a constant struggle, a constant effort, endeavor to overcome these uh, threats. Billions of rubles have been spent uh, to support uh, uh, voluntary organizations, public organizations throughout Russia. And this kind of assistance which we have achieved is absolutely invaluable. We have seen general support. Our heroes on the front lines and in the trenches are suffering the most, but they understand that the whole country is with them. I'd just like to point up here the defense of the Motherland Fund and all the voluntary organizations, all the bodies, the government bodies, uh, which are supporting our heroes, their families, their wives and children who are waiting for them to come home. I'd just like to also commend the work of uh, parliamentary parties who have supported us, uh, which has been essentially one of the bullets of support uh, for the country as a whole. Nobody is allowed to interfere in our domestic affairs.
The so-called West, with its uh, colonialist uh, tendencies, is striving not only to contain our development, but they are intent on destroying us and using our space for whatever their purposes are, including Ukraine. They are absolutely determined, determined to uh, introduce division amongst us and weaken us. And we have to ensure the determination of our people in the face of these threats. And this encompasses all the various representatives of the different regions and the multicultural nation, which is Russia. And it involves all our common efforts. Together, together, shoulder to shoulder, we are fighting for a common cause, that of the motherland. Citizens of Russia will defend our freedom and independence. It is only down to you that our way will be determined for the future. And the only people who are able to actually rise to the occasion and meet the challenges which face us. Dear friends, the defense and strengthening of our security is being affected on all fronts, particularly on the front the military front, and thanks to, that is thanks to all those who are fighting for the motherland at the moment, who are risking their lives every day, and we commend your valor. Russia will always forget, will always remember its fallen heroes. And I should just like to hear, to, to um, have a moment of silence now for them. Thank you. Our armed forces have a huge military experience, particularly in tactics, in the art of war, and it has involved a whole playard, a panoply of uh, very talented military leaders, and particularly those who are experienced in operating very uh, high-tech uh, armaments. This is absolutely essential for our military success. We understand what is to be done, and the work in that direction is being continued without pause, without respite. The combat capabilities of the armed forces have uh, shown their uh, mettle in many occasions, and they have acted absolutely mm, self-assuredly throughout our territory. As I have said uh, on many occasions, we are doing absolutely everything to solve all the tasks involved in the special military operation, to protect our sovereignty and the security of our citizens, and to show total responsibility in terms of guaranteeing the use of uh, nuclear arms. Everything has been done in that respect since uh, 2017. The Kinjal uh, weapon system has not only shown uh, its uh, strength and its capabilities, uh, but is actually uh, shown that on the ground. We have also uh, used the uh, sea-based Sirkon system, 
and very successfully. It's already in commission. And the avant-garde intercontinental ballistic missile system as well. And the Buryvesnik, the Stormy Petrol uh, system, is also a case in point. And I think we can say without any exaggeration, they have shown their unique uh, capabilities. And they are being shown to be effective in the areas of combat already. A whole range of other very state-of-the-art uh, weapon systems are being uh, elaborated and used, and all this in the interest of strategic stability. And I just want to say now, that I think that you have also all understood, particularly those government bodies that we are threatened by enemy forces who are determined, as they say themselves, to, uh, to effect a strategic defeat of Russia in the field. A very good example of that recently. Uh, we will leave uh, the president of Russia for now. Obviously, uh, continue to monitor what he has to say. In the meantime, still to come on The Breakfast Show, going to be speaking to Dame Esther Ranson's daughter, Rebecca.
Hello again, everybody. You're watching The Breakfast Show here on Sky News in just a moment. Uh, going to be speaking to Dame Esther Ranson's daughter, Rebecca. Uh, I think we have got today's top stories. We've got the top well, stories, yeah. we certainly do. Let's remind you of those this morning here on Sky News Breakfast. Dame Esther Ranson has made a renewed call for MPs to debate the law on assisted dying. Her intervention comes as MPs warn that the law in different parts of the UK is likely to diverge, with the Isle of Man set to become the first part of the British Isles to legalise assisted dying. Parents in England who take their children out of school without permission are going to face higher fines of £80. The Education Minister, Damien Hines, told this show earlier that parents who don't pay could eventually face prosecution. He hoped the measure would improve attendance. The US Supreme Court says it will rule on whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution over the January 6th Capitol riots. Meanwhile, the former president's campaign team has said he will appeal a court ruling in Illinois, which will remove him from the state's primary ballot next month. Health experts say that children are suffering needlessly because fewer parents are opting to get them vaccinated. The UK Health Security Agency is launching a new campaign to try and boost uptake. Dame Esther Ranson has made a renewed call for MPs to debate the law on assisted dying. The 83-year-old star, who has stage 4 cancer, says the current law is a mess and families like hers desperately need change. Let's speak to her daughter, Rebecca, should we? Um, hi, Rebecca. How's your mum? Well, that's the question that none of us ever know if you, um, if you have a relative or are yourself. Uh, going through cancer, you'll know that you're only as good as your last scan. But as far as we know, the miracle drug that she's on is holding everything at bay. So for the moment, she's OK. Thank you. And how's she feeling in herself? Oh, well, I think this is the last thing she wants to talk about. I mean, uh, as she sits looking at her garden, which has been a labour of love for her whole life, um, watching all the birds, she's got she's very interested by her blue tit nest, um, she cannot help but think this is the last time that she's going to see spring. And what lies ahead is daunting, is horrific. Mum is brave, she is outspoken, she is unstoppable, um, except she has a fear of pain, and who doesn't? So the thought of having a bad death, and a bad death is described in this report as one without agency that you have had no choice over, the thought of having a bad death weighs heavy on her mind. When she first brought up with the family that she was considering um, uh, heading to Dignitas when the moment came, um, how did she bring it up with you and, and how did you react? Uh, <laughs> so, did she bring it up with us? We have, we have spoken all our lives about how um, we want independence as individuals and the choice to do certain things. So we, I've always known that she would want to do what suits her life in her death. But the way that we found out about Dignitas was pretty much similar to how everybody else did. Um, there was a Times article that she wrote where she said she joined it, and that was, that was the first time I found out that she had membership. I knew she'd been talking about it, but uh, yeah, it, was a, it was a wee bit of a shock. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. And, and she has gone on since um, to talk very openly about the situation she finds herself in uh, and talking about the laws in this country, which she says are a complete mess. How do you feel about it? Oh, she's absolutely right. I mean, I think she's quoting Lord Falconer there in the report saying it's a complete mess. And other professionals in the system who have looked over the jurisdiction are quoted in the report as saying we are failing people at a time when they really need us. There are 250 million people that have access to assisted dying in all the countries that have brought in this legislation, that have changed their jurisdiction to allow it. The palliative care has, in has improved and the uptake has not gone massively out of control. It's There are protections, there are controls. It is working, and we, as this brilliant country that is usually forward-thinking, that is usually an early adopter of all the brilliant democratic um, procedures, are lagging so far behind. It, we, I feel like we are trapped in a prehistoric notion of end-of-life care being better than 
preventing pain. Surely a good death represents a good life. So if you've had dignity in life, why wouldn't you have dignity in death? And we all seem to have forgotten the incredible audio tapes by Dame Diana Rigg, where this unbelievable woman of immense power and strength has been brought to her knees by pain, by incontinence, by the absolute abysmal nature of her death. What do you say to those, Rebecca, who suggest it would then be a slippery slope and there would be um, coercion on occasion and uh, it opens the doors um, to all sorts of challenges that we really don't want our loved ones to face? Now, this seems to be the main argument point for many people, but it hasn't happened in all the other places. We're not going to be the first country to adopt this process. We can look at the amazing raft of legislation that is out there and pick and choose, cherry pick our best um, way forward so that vulnerable people are protected. Um, my family, we're only talking about terminal illness. We're not talking about mental health at all. We're talking about terminal illness um, with a six month life expectancy and it's a physical illness. We're not going along the lines of mental health, which I know can be one of the most painful um, th things to experience. But at the moment, we're just asking for physical illness with a life expectancy of six months or less for the people that are experiencing that to have the agency to choose death without pain. Um, and the other countries that have brought this in, there hasn't been this terrifying slippery slope of coercive death. Um, and we have to protect the vulnerable, of course we do, but we're not reinventing the wheel. People have done this around the world and they've done it brilliantly and we need to follow them. Rebecca, how hard is it um, balancing respect for your mum's wishes uh, and your instinct not to let her go? Well, it's just impossible, isn't it? Um, the other thing that Lord Falconer talked about in the report is the fact that if you encourage or enable in any way your loved one to end their life, and that includes just travelling alongside them to Dignitas, you face prosecution, which he calls a hellish experience. There is testimony from a family that were under investigation for two years, and it cost them thousands of pounds to defend themselves from supporting their mother through the end of her life and her choice to have a good death. And, you know, they were brought to their knees by it. And one of them attempted suicide. So everything surrounding this is messy. We could make it so much easier. The fact that mum is dying is appalling. I can't bear it. She's, I speak to her half a dozen times a day, at least. She is my person. I don't want to think about her dying. But if I do, I want to think about her having her choices and her to have the comfortable dreamlike death of it's in her bed, surrounded by her family and, you know, having a fabulous last meal and then taking a very careful cocktail of drugs that gives her an incredibly painless death. Who, who wouldn't want that? Um, I don't want to think about it. I want to ground any plane that she thinks that she's getting on and rip the drugs from her hands. But the alternative is appalling. The alternative of a painful death is unthinkable. So it's, it's horrific to have to fight for this at a time when all we should be doing is cherishing the best moments we have rather than worrying about the worst moments to come. If, you're, if your mum wanted you to go to um, Dignitas with her, would you ever consider doing that and then facing the consequences uh, when you came home? It's, it's, I, I've thought about this quite a lot. I obviously, mm. I, I know your mum a little bit and I've been reading uh, her story uh, in the Daily Express. I, I think a lot about the family and the challenges that you're facing very much in the public eye. And I, I also wondered what I would do if my mum had said to me when she was alive, will you come with me and hold my hand? I mean, how do you say no to that? How do you say no to that? Obviously, I'm a working mum of two very young boys. I don't have time to go to prison. I mean, who does? I 
I, and that's the last thing that mum would want. She would absolutely be furious if I came with her at a cost to my freedom and my family. Um, I'm also deputy president of Childline. I don't know whether you can do that with a criminal record. Um, and what a ridiculous reason to have a criminal record. So legally, I cannot say I would go with her, but realistically, there's no way she's going alone. Um, I hear Switzerland is very nice. I've never been. Maybe I would have a, a, a coincidental alongside trip. How are, you, how are you coping, Rebecca? Oh, well, you're lovely to ask, but please don't ask me that because I'll burst into tears. Uh, I don't know. How does anyone cope with this? this it's horrible. Uh, lots of people have it lots worse. And mum is receiving gold star treatment um, and is surrounded by people who love her. Um, I, just, um, I just would rather be talking about anything else today yeah um if it's any comfort at all it's a privilege to grow old and you ha will spend every moment with your mum in her final days and, and that is also a privilege uh it's good to talk to you thank you thank you i know powerful it's powerful it's emotive rebecca puts forward a very very a strong case for assisted dying. But we have to remember there is the other side of the argument. And I know you mentioned it when you were talking to her about the slippery slope, and that is a genuine concern. When you speak to medics who are opposed to assisted dying, and they will tell you about the pressure people who are approaching the end of their lives feel. They might feel like they're a burden to their family. They might have life-limiting illnesses or conditions and feel that this is an easy way out. How do you find that balance? How do you find the safeguards to assure everyone that if you want autonomy over your death, you have it, but everyone has the same choice? That is, that, that is the conundrum, and that's so difficult. I still don't know where I stand on this, but listening to these very compelling arguments, it makes you think, and I think that's the most important thing. We should be having this conversation. Yeah, Wilf's with us as well. Wilf, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I think I probably stood slightly to one side and that interview kind of moves me back to, to the other side. But, but like Ashish, it's, it's a very, very difficult one to, to, to form a conclusion on. The, the main thought from that interview, though, Kay, is it's one thing for a family to have to deal with this issue and discuss it at home and also process uh, all of the, the factors at play that, that this family would have to process. It's a whole other thing to actually talk about it publicly and campaign on something that you're, you're passionate about. And that is really unbelievably uh, impressive and inspiring. And I guess we shouldn't be that surprised when it's from the family of, of Dame Esther Ransom. Um, and uh, I just thought that was very, very compelling. Yeah, she has been a lifelong campaign on all sorts of subjects, um, hasn't she, at not least um, Childline. And she has chosen, as has the rest of the family, to go public because they want to get the law changed. Listening to Rebecca and, and what she would do if her mum did finally decide that she did want to go to Dignitas, it's, it's, it's just an impossible, impossible choice to make. Uh, absolutely. I mean, again, without having gone into the details of the law that Ashish will know much better than I, but th there seems like some small steps that could be quite easy. For, the, for example, the idea that you'd have to pretend you're visiting Switzerland uh, on the side and, and not be able to return to the country afterwards, that, that seems slightly different from if we're talking about legalising it domestically and whether some, some small steps could be taken, uh, which everyone might, might agree on. I, d I don't know, but I just thought that was uh, very, very compelling. And uh, what, what an amazing family and what an amazing uh, matriarch and, and lady that, uh, of course, is inspiring this conversation. I think it's going to be difficult for the Isle of Man. That they're, they're inching ever closer to bringing in this legislation. I would speak to one family in the morning, be convinced assisted dying is way, and then speak to doctors who specialise in palliative care, and then be swayed by their argument too. There are such convincing arguments on both sides, and I think that is why we are at this impasse, and that's why we haven't got um, legislation in place. Well, we're not talking about it in in Parliament, but I think certainly. 
the conversation is being had and people are more readily having this conversation. And I was wondering this morning on my way in to see you this morning, I thought, during the pandemic, we asked the question, are we talking about death more? Maybe that, that time we lived through the pandemic, we saw our loved ones die, maybe we are more ready or in a position to, to address this now. It's a great question. The answer is I don't know. Um, but certainly, um, Dame Esther's um, daughter was very um, powerful. Incredibly she? powerful. Yeah. Incredibly powerful. And you, you feel for the whole family. Absolutely. And indeed, so many other families that yes, are going through yes, the same situation. We'll see you at the top of the hour, Will. Thanks. Uh, we're back in just a second. Kalna and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy, violent drug addict. How are you feeling? You I am angry. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Mom, how are you feeling today? Jeffrey said, you answer to get in, you just don't cross her. You're so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. A ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. Slightly more, slightly better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Got a pearly king with us. Oh, yes, we have. So there. Hi, it's good to see you. Good morning. Uh, Clive. So talk to me about being a pearly king. Pearly king? Ah, yeah. oh, well, it's an honour. More than anything else, but it's an honour. We go out, meet people and raise money for charity. And that's the sort of be all and end all of it, really. You know, it would bring a smile to a face. OK, so you know? tell me about the outfit. The outfit's very personal, all pearl buttons, no plastic buttons. Um, there's a couple of sort of classic designs, the wheels and the markets and the all shoes. Uh, but yeah, you can put on more or less anything you like, as long as you don't copy anyone's exactly, you can have it very, very personal. Pearls around the top? Indeed. Fantastic. So tell me about being a Cockney. Well, a Cockney, well, it depends what defines a Cockney. There's a lot of different issues now, and this is what we're here for today, really. Talk about things generally Cockney. The old thing about being born in the sound of Bow Bells, yes, still around, but uh, there's a couple of lads out there called uh, Andy Green, Safe Osmani, Cockney cultures, and they're trying to change the perception, really, of Cockney and try to sort of spread 
you know, who can be called a, a, a Cockney, really? So can people in Essex who have moved out of the traditional art land of Cockney call themselves Cockneys? Of course they can. People who have been brought up as a Cockney elsewhere, people who now live in London, as long as you've got the ethos of being a Cockney, you know, a, I don't know, so resourceful, a good sense of humour. You've got to have a good sense of humour, be able to take a bit of stick and a bit of banter. Um, yeah, and they're the, they're the sort of things we're looking at. So we're trying to spread um, who can be or who can claim to be. A I thought you had to be a cabbie to be a Cockney. Kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. There's a fair few of those, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people who claim to be Cockneys, yes. Yeah. But, uh, no, it's nice. We want to spread the word. Be, be a Cockney club or a Cockney gang. Yeah. You know, all of London. Why not? Yeah, you know? my son was born um, at a hospital in northwest London on Highgate Hill. Yes, yes. And of course, that is where the Lord Mayor of London turned again. Yes. He's heard Bow Bell, so he always says that he's a Cockney. So he yes. absolutely insists that you have to Why not? be within the sound of Bow Bells. Well, that, well, that came around. Years and years ago, 1571, okay, where uh, someone was given a, a sermon and he said, ye, I'll put a ye in so it sounds good, <laughs> ye, ye, ye who was born in London or within the sound of Bow Bills. But at the time, London was literally the city of London, the square mile, yes. which is neither a square or a mile, but that's another story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and of course, St Mary Bow Church, the big tenor bell, the great bell of Bow, which didn't cost a tenner, it was actually the note of a tenner. Yes. Um, yeah, so it could be heard all over London. Mm -hmm. So the ethos of that remark was all of London, mm -hmm. is my perception of it. OK. So... Always debatable, of course. <laughs> but you're saying you can live in Scotland or you can live overseas and still be a Cockney? No. OK. No. What are you saying? It's a London-based thing. Yes. So we, we don't mind going out too far. OK. You know, South End, it's all right, <laughs> you know. A little bit of art. As far as Barnet. A little bit of Hertfordshire. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I don't know about Berkshire. <laughs> right, yeah, a few Berks over there, isn't there? You know, down to Kent, down to Surrey. Um, yeah, you know, so you, your family's gone out there. So your family was London, now it's gone out there. That's the sort of thing. So we're inclusive. We're inclusive. OK, what do you want people to think about Cockneys? It's uh, no preconceptions of Cockneys. We've been painted in a very bad light usually through the media, and I don't blame you, but, you know, honestly not. Uh, but you think of, um, well, I think Dick Van Dyke was the only half-decent one, you know, the cool, blimey Mary Poppins line, you know, he was the only decent cockney there was. <laughs> and, of course, we had 101 Dalmatians, you know, your two dodgy, bungling characters, Cruella de Vil psychics, yep. you know, sort of typecast, weren't they, really, yep. as, as bungling, stupid cockneys. Um, where else? A lot of Dickens characters, they were the dodgy side of things, weren't they? You know, Bill Sykes, dodgy character, East End, uh, Cockney. You know, so we've been painted in a bad light. And of course, you think of mums and teachers talking to their kids, saying, sound your H's, you know. And so you've got to have, moving on to Middle England language, and you've got to have something to compare it with. Yeah. So don't talk that Cockney. <laughs> as soon as you say that, don't talk Cockney. That's a bad thing. OK. You know, so that's, that's the, that's and the paint. And you have to support West Ham? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. Who's your I'm, team? I'm a Spurs man myself. Oh, like, you know. I was seeing it was going so well. It was going so well, and now I'm going yeah, to... Although, although I'm Pearly King of Woolwich, which is where Arsenal come from originally, yeah, like, yeah. you know, so I've got a bit of a... Uh, yeah. yeah, I've got to tread carefully there. Uh, fantastic outfit. Good to see you. Thanks Thank you. for taking the time to join us. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Much appreciated. Thank you. Have a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Next few days bringing further rain, turning cold, hill uh, snow likely as uh, southeastern quarter of England looks mild but wet. Through the rush hour elsewhere, it's going to be quite chilly with blustery showers running into western coasts. To fly. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Uh, some breaking news from the Gaza Health Ministry. Alistair standing by for us. Alistair? Well, a grim milestone this morning as the death toll, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, in less than five months of fighting, has now surpassed 30,000 Palestinians in Gaza. The official number being given to us this morning is 30,035 killed since October the 7th, uh, almost, or well, sorry, just over 70,000 people injured as well. Now, the Israeli military 
uh, estimate among that death toll, uh, around 12,000 of those Hamas fighters. Uh, but international organisations say that amongst the civilians, the worst affected have been women and children who have died in their many thousands. We've seen, uh, despite uh, the claims from the Israeli military that they are prioritising civilian lives and civilian welfare. We have seen over the months of the war the tone, particularly from uh, the Americans, change as they become increasingly concerned about the high number of civilians being killed in Gaza and not just being killed. As I said, I mentioned the injured as well. But the humanitarian crisis is becoming ever more acute. The desperation to get aid, the inability to actually get aid to to a lot of the Gaza Strip because of the fighting at the moment means that uh, countries have had to resort to aid drops uh, and people are scrabbling around for anything they can get. So the uh, 30,000 dead is is a figure, it is a milestone, uh, but it is an indication of the severity of the crisis inside Gaza as the fighting continues and as Israel continues to fight Hamas and to try and defeat Hamas and get their hostages home. OK, for now, um, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That's about it from us, isn't it, for this week? Yeah. You're going to be here tomorrow. Here tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, you weren't last Thursday, but you are this... Uh, last Friday, but you are this mm -hmm. Friday coming, which is great. Uh, Wilfie's coming up uh, next, and we are back uh, with all... Uh, whatever next week might bring from uh, 6 o'clock on Monday morning. One more award winning Just one thing. journalism from Sky News. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot the award. There we go. One more time. Uh, yeah. One more time. <laughs> one more time. One more time. Uh, 29th of February today, yeah. leap year. Uh, if you are celebrating your birthday today, you can only do it once every four years. Very happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and Wilf, as I said, is next. We'll see you next week. Go us. Go us.